Hello out there in podcast land. This is the Open Betas podcast, starring Regal and Swimfan. Can you do Are a we... radio voice? Your voice got really low just now. Sorry to cut you off. Yeah, when I'm presenting, it gets uh... oh nice. <laughs> it gets into Excellent. some sort of mode that I can't help. Welcome to the Open Betas. Podcast. Welcome to Open Betas podcast. <laughs> Coming up next, Rolling Stones. Uh, You're really dating yourself with that one. <laughs> well, I'd say that's before my time, even. Well, uh, all right. So, yes, welcome to Open Betas, the podcast about the life of games and the game of life. You nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> I just did it slowly for uh, effect. So, today we're talking about the phenomenon of new players. Or as some call them, normies or normos or normits. Normits? uh, Oh, sure. Yeah, we're talking about uh, players that are not only new to a game, but specifically who are new to gaming and how it is to be a non-gamer playing games. Also, how can we improve that, if at all possible? And various other discussions like that. Coming up next... An open Wait, we're, having, we're getting, going on break already? We just started. And we're back. Thanks for <laughs> listening. Yeah, so uh, this is this encompasses what's usually called, quote-unquote, the new player experience mm-hmm. right? by, the, by the marketing and exec types who mm-hmm. talk in buzzwords. Um, or but tutorial, more, right? Yeah, or the tutorial, right? Uh, as... <laughs> Which is a more reasonable well, well, although although the tutorial is only part of the new player experience, right? Yes, uh, we're talking about the entire ramp up from brand new to I can competently play right. this game or even potentially play online, right? And uh, but this discussion also goes beyond that. It goes into kind of the meta discussion of talking about, in addition to the new player experience for a single game. The new player experience as a new gamer, which wow, that's mm-hmm. that is like the most cringe sentence I think I've ever said in my life. The new player experience for a new gamer. Yeah, um, I've been hanging out with a lot of young people recently, so the Zoomer uh, vocabulary is like entering my vernacular. So well, like I just said cringe, uh... like a normal, like <laughs> as part of everyday speech. You see? Oh, is that so, too? Is that a younger younger person thing? Cringe? It is. Yeah, they're teaching me. They make fun of me, and then they teach me, and then I like pick up vernacular from them. I, uh, I, I try never, not to. I had never heard scuffed before, y- you guys. Yeah, scuffed is a little bit older. Yeah. The kids these days say things like bussin and op, which I, OP? I like, vaguely understand what these mean. No, like OPP, like uh-huh. opposition or whatever. This is getting uh, scary. Anyway, yeah, I know. This is land we don't want to venture into. Yeah. We need to. We need to well, so not be. Uh, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say let's uh, let's jump in then. Um, yeah, talking about the whole player ramp up experience versus uh, versus uh, across games versus a specific mm-hmm. game is is they're pretty different. I was gonna say I think we should um I think we should specify what how this discussion started in the first place, which is uh we saw this video, it's a very popular video, it has like seven million views or whatever on YouTube about um what it's like to play games for a non gamer. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, we can uh, link this is, in the uh in the show mm-hmm. notes. Um and so this kind of got us talking and thinking about uh this entire topic about how, how much it's kind of a rich subject about how playing games as someone that's played games for a long time you take a lot of things for granted that when you take a step back and think about it you realize it's hard to get in at a very basic level if you're starting out right yeah yeah it can be there's a lot to learn that now we take for granted Mm -hmm. uh so i want to start just with a just personal story along those lines uh about the, the 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 gap of knowledge between us as video game players now and totally new players to games period uh mm-hmm. you need no you need look no further than my wife who uh 
I have since obviously since a kid b- b- since I was a kid I was into video games and she never was she was mm-hmm. never allowed to have them etc cetera, etc cetera. but she has played some games with me in the in the uh course of dating and being married to me uh right. in an attempt to grow closer and it has worked <laughs> well most of the time <laughs> <laughs> Coincidentally, this is this is very similar to the conceit of the video, the aforementioned video. Yes, right? he's talking about his wife or or whatever significant yeah. other. So, uh, so the first game she played with me, uh, I suggested a co op game, Bubble Bobble, for the Nintendo Entertainment System. You know that game, Little Dragons uh, Blown this Bubbles. Is, this is the one where you match, you shoot uh, a line, and then it sticks to the top, and then the matching colors explode, right? Yeah, that was the survive. spin-off, Bust a Move, where oh. you it's oh. more of like a puzzle game. This one is more like a platformer weird thing. I'll show you a video later. But anyway. Okay. I do in that case I do not. Okay, playing playing games together, you know, where I could help out and, you know, get us through mm-hmm. the tough parts. That that worked okay because there's less uh less strain on her. Um but as we yeah, and it still was just the Nintendo controller with had, you know, directions and A and B, and it was pretty pretty simple to learn. But as you go forward in time, it uh, games tend to get a little more complicated, and uh, uh, the controllers, for example, go from two buttons to four buttons to six buttons, etc. And uh, so, for example, when... Uh, when we got to the PlayStation era, one of the games we liked to play was Um Jammer Lammy. Do you know that game? It's like the Parappa the I Rapper game. I certainly do not. You know Parappa uh, the okay. Rapper? Well, I do I do know Parappa the Rapper. It's like that, except it's a, you're playing guitar with a band oh, okay. instead of I see. Uh, rapping. Rapping cool. Uh, and we played that one a lot together, it's but that one was like, a huge challenge for her because she didn't know the buttons, right? So it's got like a it's a rhythm game, and it's uh, got the triangles coming at you and the X's and the squares, and you got if you got to look at the controller each time that happens, you're not gonna you're not gonna be having a good time. Coincidentally, I also don't know the buttons. Yeah, because you're a PC gamer. That's correct. I'm a PC and Nintendo gamer mostly, so. Yeah, and for some reason, the buttons are all foreign to me. They all are like slightly different, so that it's super confusing to go from one to the other yes, it's super confusing uh it's an it's one of those mean competition things uh but i i know everything pretty well i use an xbox controller for pc games i use mm-hmm. nintendo controllers i still play the switch and i play playstation games so i kind of know them all uh but that came over years and years of, of playing the games uh right. And so eventually we kind of leveled up to more complicated games, but the more complicated it got, the less I think she was interested in continuing to play because Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. it just becomes a little bit more stressful. Uh, It becomes more work. Mm -hmm. We played through Mm -hmm. all of Final Fantasy VII together, uh, which as JRPGs go is fairly straightforward, but I, I had to step in sometimes to help with the battles. Um, and then Nino Kuni. Do you know that one? It's like the the Studio Ghibli yep. uh, JRPG. Yep. It's um, it's very cute. So she wanted to play that as well. But that was a mm-hmm. such a level of like uh, coordination and planning and uh, reacting during battles that we just couldn't. Yep. We didn't get very far, and before she bounced off of that. So basically. There's a lot of different barriers I've I've seen firsthand uh, that come into play, and the last uh, one I'll mention is we played the uh, exploration game, walking simulator, Gone Home. Do you know that one, the mm-hmm. narrative game? Uh, I do not, but uh, I can imagine what it's like. It's uh, very short, very straightforward, but it requires you to move within a 3D space, and uh, mm-hmm. that means using one. Well, using the keyboard and mouse or using two analog sticks, which we can get to later. Right. But that is the analog stick thing is a huge learning barrier mm-hmm. for games and for 3D games specifically. And I'm going to call 3D games, uh, you know, games that use have camera systems and uh, polygons, not not jump out at you like the, the damn avatars. <laughs> OK, uh, or like LARPing. What's LARPing that? It's like a 3D game. 
or like LARPing. Yeah, that's like a really 3D game. Yeah, that's a true 3D game. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and beyond, okay. and even in addition to learning all that, there are sometimes physical barriers to playing games. Like some people just get motion sick, like you. I'm calling you out, like me. That's right. And uh, uh, funny enough, I don't remember if I mentioned this, but that didn't start until like fairly late in life. But anyway. Oh really? When 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 did it? Yeah. Uh, so I distinctly remember playing uh, the summer of like my freshman year of college. So when I was eighteen. Um, or 19, Mm -hmm. I distinctly remember playing Saints Row 4 and really enjoying it that summer and having no problems. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, But around, it was also very similar around around that time that I was playing Minecraft and I started having problems. That was the first time I distinctly remember feeling like, oh man, Minecraft is really... Because like I've I've like on and off had motion sickness, but it was never, Mm -hmm. it was like fine enough to play something like uh, play like Counter Strike. I played in high school, one point six, right? And yep. that was that was fine. Oh and I yeah. Minecraft oh, so you did play a fully first person game like that? I was gonna yeah, ask if I it's, did. if the third uh, person perspective made a difference. No, uh, it does. The third person, uh, I, I'm usually fine with third person, um, even shooters, mm-hmm. uh, generally speaking. Uh, but it was it was some it was sometime after, uh, like around when I turned twenty, um, it started being really noticeable. And the first time I noticed it was oh. in Minecraft. Wow. And I was like, okay, I can I can no longer play Minecraft. But uh, you've overcome adversity and uh, have remained a gamer nonetheless. Well, sure. Uh, to be fair, th- most, one of the reasons I'm not sh- I don't, yeah, well, to be, yeah, right. To be fair, that most one of the main reasons I don't actually know the exact time is because I don't play that many of that kind of game anyway. So that, yeah, that was naturally uh, what you were doing anyway, yeah. more or less. Right, right. Well, that's, that's handy. <laughs> And there are yeah, there's a lot of other games to choose from, but it is when you think of like the big yearly blockbusters, they generally are yeah the ones that are 3D games. And to be fair, I've never I've like almost never been interested in uh, like the AAA titles mm-hmm. as a as a whole, which which is an interesting topic about why. Uh, the first thing I the thing that really stands out to me about talking about your wife is um, and this this is something I didn't really think about at the time when watching the video, but why do why did your wife want to play the games uh to do something with me to connect with me right uh, i'm sure that right. yeah and that's that's kind of what um i thought and i think that's fundamentally different than why you wanted to play the game yeah i mean if you don't right. if you're not intrinsically motivated to learn something you learn it worse right exactly and you bounce very quickly because for example, the joy of, uh, so for example, like um, one of the things we'll talk about later is like frustrations, right? And if you're intrinsically motivated to learn to play the game or to beat the game for whatever reason it is, mm-hmm. um, overcoming frustration is a lot easier because you feel some kind of great satisfaction when you achieve your goal, Yep. generally speaking, right? If that's not an intrinsic uh, joy for you, then the frustration becomes a massive barrier for than for someone who yeah. wants to play the game. It's just it's just frustration and that's it just doesn't feel good. Yeah, I mean that it's makes kinda like, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's kind of like working out, right? Actually, I was talking about working out with my coworker um just uh talking about the act of working out mm-hmm. with my coworker. Uh not not talking about doing it together cuz imagine working out. Yeah, gross. Um we were talking about yesterday and it was like, yeah, like at the end of the day um the reason if your reason for working out is not something very close to i just like something intrinsic about working out mm-hmm. if it's something like i want to f- uh, for me it would be like you know i want to be i want long term health mm-hmm. right or better aerobic health or if it's something like that it's very very hard to stick to it just because those things it's hard to use those things to keep you going when any kind of frustration comes up, right? When any kind of friction. Yeah. And I mean, I've, I'm assuming you've bounced off the gym a few times like I have. Oh, yeah. Uh, Just like everyone else that doesn't feel great about themselves after working out, right? Or like doesn't see themselves yeah, as someone that maybe wants to we, Have we talked about this? The people who talk about like a, a high or a rush after working out and how oh, I, yeah. I don't. Uh, have well, that we at haven't all. talked about this, but we, we haven't talked about this, but mm-hmm. yeah, um, that's. That definitely makes sense. Yeah. And I think gaming is honestly um, almost everything in life that's like 
aspirational is like that, right? Or th- in other words, anything that takes a lot of effort. Yeah, anything that's um, worth it. Right. And the thing is, like, it's worth it for different reasons to different people. Right? Yeah. Um, I've heard this in context of learning a language, too, that, you know, wanting mm. to yep. really feeling passionate about learning it and enjoying learning it makes a huge difference in how well yep. you retain things, which, of course, makes <laughs> sense. Uh, it's, you know, it's true of learning, of working out, of your career, right? Which of, which fits with uh, how well I remember the details of video games. Uh, in terms <laughs> right. Because I really wanted to play them and, and, and figure them out. And now I still remember, you know, the Konami code or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think that's, that is one, one big thing where, you know, as a, as a game designer or developer, when you're, you know, if you're trying to expand the reach to the most people possible, that also means expanding the reach to people that um, are playing your game for a reason other than they want to play the game, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like for some intrinsic reason. And that, that changes a lot of things uh, about like how much frustration you can put in and that also changes kind of people's goals. Um, and that's a lot of complexity to to your target. Yeah, but, yeah, I mean, that 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 makes sense. And it's just, you know, if she, for example, if my, if my wife has no real intention of playing games by herself or in the future, it's just, it's all like, you know, I'll do whatever to get through this part, but I'm not really learning for the long term. Right. Uh, right. And uh, one other thing I'll say related to motion sickness is, you know, she complains about eye strain. Like it, it gives her a headache to play a game for more than an hour. And maybe that has to do with like, focusing on so much or potentially it has to do with wearing glasses. I don't know if you've experienced something similar. Uh, I have not, but uh, I can, I can see it or, you know, people can play Australian with reading, right. If they're not used to reading. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that's probably similar. Just like people, you know, normies that spend a lot of time outside um, are often not used to, this is not a derogatory term, but they're physically just not used to focusing on, something on a screen or on a page for extended periods of time. Yep. Yep. Um, So I imagine it's very similar to the thing with reading. Yeah, I I, I think so too. I mean, that makes sense. Not, not having experience with the thing. It's just, uh, it's so hard for, it's interesting to me because it's so hard for me to put myself in that position because I've exactly since the age three have been staring at screens, watching things move around. Uh, Me too. And that, that brings me to, um, a quick aside I, I want to talk about, which is it's very different because um, I've never experienced the latter, but it's very different being a new player as a kid versus as an adult, right? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, go on. It's almost like learning a new language as a kid versus as an adult because, uh, and and not really sure exactly why, but one, one thing that I feel like is empirically true uh, and I don't really know why is that your expectations go up as you get older, right? For whatever it is that you're doing. Um, maybe, uh, okay. for example, maybe it's just because you're more cynical. So for example, as a kid, when you learn a new language, you don't have an expectation that like, um, I, you know, I need to schedule some amount of time in my day or I need to like reach this target or like there's a test I need to pass. Mm-hmm. When you're seven years old and you're learning a language, just go to school and you just learn the language. And it's like, there's nothing around it that makes you there's almost nothing that discourages you, right? Because you don't, it's almost like you don't really understand what it's like to be discouraged. (laughs) Right. Um, right. And, and games, I, I, I would think are, are very similar. Um, Just because if you're having fun doing the thing for, and I think the barrier for having fun as a kid is so much lower. Yes. Um, Yeah. And especially with video games, it's like, there's so, I mean, maybe this is just for some people, but there's so, instantly like interesting and fun uh right compared to other toys right. you have in a lot of cases anyway yeah i i certainly think so um which you know somehow uh a certain breed of parent makes that out to be a bad thing mm-hmm. like hey this thing has a lot of stimulation it must be bad yeah uh because it's different than the dirt in the playground, I guess. Yeah, that's uh, maybe never, an interesting discussion we should have separately about. I never the, really are games good or yeah. bad. <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's what a great, what a truly great discussion topic that would be. Oh, it would um, be good. Um, 
What was that talking about? Oh, I was gonna say like uh, you know, somehow they're very stimulating. But as a kid, you know, running in. Uh, so for example, we we did this let's play of a game I played as a kid, and seeing it as an adult makes me realize all kinds of problems it has. Right. Mm-hmm. But as a kid, you don't really notice those things. You kind of, uh, in in that specific case, it's like, well, this is what the game gives me to do, and this is what it puts in front of me. So I'm just gonna. Do it, and if I can't do it, I'm going to do something like grind for three hours until I, I level up. I had I had the notion as a kid that uh, games were complete and balanced, mm-hmm. and yep. everything yep. was intentional in a way that I, you know, learned my way out of uh, as an adult, especially working in gaming. Right. But uh, yeah, Me I just too. I was like, oh well, this, you know, the the battle toads level where you're on the jet ski it has to be beautiful i'm just not thinking of something to do Mm -hmm. but in actuality it's near impossible do you know this example uh i don't know this example but yeah uh, battle toads uh jet ski game oh speaking of which uh when i said the konami code do you not know the konami code i do know the konami code. okay you do i do it is up up down down left right left right ba select start yeah that's the call that's the two-player version you you had a friend ah uh well I I didn't oh. but I also never actually used I never actually actually used yeah Konami you didn't have the console anything. right maybe maybe in like a couple of GBA games yeah yeah, yeah. anyway so. um yeah anyway I I do think there's something somehow something is different when you pick up games and this is probably true of any hobby to be honest right um as a kid versus as an adult um, you're also aware of see... the cultural connotations of like right. uh person who is a who plays a lot of games especially right. as an adult i mean it's more it's way more acceptable than it used to be but it's not like there are mm-hmm. no connotations that come with it yeah it's certainly true although you know these days it's it's more nuanced because there's like gamers and then there's like call of duty players right who are like a totally almost a totally disparate group in, in many ways i mean according to us sure yeah that's true according to us that is that is true um but yeah I, I think for, so. For example, I think one of the ways you see this a lot is with nostalgia, which we're all, uh, whether we think we are or not, like super, super susceptible to. Mm-hmm. Um, even with games, right? People, uh, people often make statements somewhat that are along the lines of like, "Well, they don't make games like they used to," or like the <laughs> games we played as kids were great, right? Um, yeah. And it's not really until that you really go back and play with a uh, adult's mentality or a critical eye in. In other words, um, that you kind of understand that, like, that's often not true, right? And it's like somehow there is like there are a few quote unquote timeless gems, but for the most part, the games that you have such great memories of are not nearly as good as you remember them to be. You know, uh, that reminds me. I I mentioned before in a previous episode that I have a list of my 100 favorite games of all time, mm-hmm. and I noticed that there were no original Nintendo games on there. Uh, mm, and and looked through everything. I actually looked through several lists of like the best Nintendo, the best NES games of all time. Right. And like remembered which ones I'd played and everything. And there's still not one of them makes that list. But the remakes of a lot of these games on the Super Nintendo mm. make that list. But uh, it was just, it was interesting to me that none of those uh, 8-bit generation games stood the test of time now, whereas some of the Super Nintendo games do, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I totally get that. Um, totally agree. And I think a large part of that also is uh, a lot of the times the best of lists are made, uh, you know, one of the criteria is like importance, right? Which kind of... Um, importance? Which may not be your criteria. Importance like uh, effect on the general... like. Uh, What's the right word? Impact? Uh, impact. Yeah, there we go. Like impact on the scene or as gaming culture as a whole or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you know, the technical aspect, any any actual problems that are problems by today's standards obviously get brushed aside because, uh, you know, oh, they were good for their time or they were groundbreaking at the time or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, an, an, an oft-cited example is GoldenEye. For the 64 right how yep. that was you know yep. kind of the first console multiplayer shooter with an analog control even if you couldn't look and move at the same time yet uh right but yeah looking at it now it's like oh my gosh that's it looks like a 
you know, tech demo for the first 3D something ever. Yeah. And I think, you know, both both points are are valid. Like both of those things can be true, right? Like it can both be highly impactful and groundbreaking, but it can also not hold up by modern standards. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, and it's important to understand both perspectives and use the one that applies best to what you're doing. Um, so why don't we, uh, unless you have any more to talk about there, let's, no, why don't we move on it. to talking a bit about, you know, what games are like for a non, a non gamer mm -hmm. and talk about some of those, uh, established gaming conventions that mm -hmm. we we take for granted and there's a long list and you know i noted a few that are big ones like mm -hmm. uh at least on consoles hitting the a button to jump or the bottom button on the right uh to use jump just that's what everyone goes with because that's what you're mm -hmm. used to uh going from left to right in a side scroller uh, is just take it for granted uh, a lot. Mm -hmm. um, a sprint button. I mean, this video gave the example mm -hmm. of Super Mario Brothers, the original, which had a, had a dedicated sprint button. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't tell you in the game back then. You had to read the instruction manual. Uh, but I think like I mentioned time. to you my terrible Dark Souls story, right? Uh, I think so, but go ahead and mention yeah. it again. So, like a dirty non-gamer, uh, when I picked mm. up Dark Souls for the first time, I, for whatever reason, I missed that the B button held down makes you sprint. Uh, right. And I thought of it as simply the dodge button, because I think you dodge roll with that mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so right. I never held it down and I beat the entire game, never sprinting ever. Like I was always moving at the walking speed or whatever, whatever the normal speed is. And part of that is because it only popped up on screen once and no right. part required me to use it to get through, you know, that, that sort of standard of tutorials where it's like, Hey, mm -hmm. you you just mm -hmm. learned double jump. And if you're going to get through this spot, you better double jump or else you haven't learned it. You know, they didn't do that. We, Yeah. We will talk about this idea of what happens if you, just delete all the tutorials. And I think one of the big problems is you can sometimes go the whole game without learning that something exists, right? Abs the thing absolutely. is like, the thing is like, if you, if you give, if the player knows that they have a tool and they choose not to use it, that's fine, right? But mm -hmm. it's very, um, I think it's just a bad experience for everyone involved, you know, from the developer to the player, if they somehow don't know that they have a certain tool. Yeah, right? and I mean, Another another side of that is uh, learning so many tools that you find a way to play at the same that time, works right? yeah at the same time or or mm -hmm. even uh, st even stacking on top of of one it's after true. the other like right. if you get to a point where well I can beat this every battle using all these right. other things right but I always forget to use my alt or whatever like. Mm -hmm. Is that the game's fault that they don't make me use it? You know, they That's don't true. get me yeah. to use it more. I, you know, I don't know. I I'm trying to think of an example of that, but I I can't. Uh, I have a I have an example of that. Mm -hmm. Um, the Yu-Gi-Oh single player games. Oh, okay. So Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, I don't know if you ever played these. I'm a big fan of. Well, you I'm told historically me a, a big fan of these games. Yeah. Um, they're they're basically uh they're fun single player experiences. You know, mm -hmm. you it's exactly what you expect. You do a story uh in the story you you fight people or you can just fight people for fun uh when you win you get money you can use money to buy booster packs yeah right um the thing with Yu-Gi-Oh and so there's a couple reasons this happens one thing with Yu-Gi-Oh is uh the cards are highly uh non-interoperable um Mm -hmm. for for some design we could do i could do a whole episode on Yu-Gi-Oh, probably uh, i mean I we should certainly do flaws. we should certainly do card games or, and digital card games yeah uh, uh if i can get if i can get uh yip for that he might that might be great oh i would be very interested to see what someone working in the industry thinks about Yu-Gi-Oh, because i have a lot of opinions he's, but anyway he's got a, uh, he'll have an opinion about every single thing you've heard of so oh, it'll be, it'll be oh good. let's do it <laughs> i'm super excited so maybe not everything um, but anyway a lot Anyway, a Yu-Gi-Oh um, triple triad. You know about triple triad. Uh, yes. You mean the Final Fantasy VIII thing? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's a card game, technically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, anyway, Yu-Gi-Oh, the cards are super non-interoperable. 
Uh, and I don't want to get into the details of why. But basically, when you get a card, you mean they don't function never, together. They don't. Yes. Right. Combo. So, like in your deck, most of the time you get a new card, and it's like, oh, I can't use this. This is for uh, the plant deck. Yeah, oh, I can't yeah. use this. This is for elemental heroes, and it's very, very obvious, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the second thing is they have a ton of text when you get a new card, um, and the third thing is that uh, you you don't get that many of them. So, for example, you might be like, oh, I see, I get some elemental hero cards in this pack. Uh, let me try to make a deck. Oh, I don't have enough. Uh, I'll come back to it later, and then you forget. Right? Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. These are th none of these are like uh, are crippling issues. Like I had a lot of fun playing the games, but the result is basically what you describe, which is okay. Well, I'm just gonna make. Uh, I'm gonna grind here because uh, I want to pick this deck. Uh, this deck is good, and then I'm gonna play the rest of the game with this deck. Right. Right. Like I've I've got I've got what works for me, and I'm gonna kind of just right. forget about all that other stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's interesting. And that's another that reminds me again of, uh, you know, how I used to think of games as perfect and stuff where it's like, well, if right. they give me something, I have to use it. Like, it, like I can't get right. to the game if I don't use it. But that's not always true. Uh, it is not always true. So another one I want to mention. In fact, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, well, I just want to say, in fact, thinking back as a kid, a lot of the time, actually, my attitude was kind of the opposite, which is like, well, I just want to do things this way. I think this thing is cool. I'm just going to lean into it. Mm -hmm. So the first time I played Fire Emblem, I I just leveled only my uh, horse characters. I was big. I was a big horse enjoyer. Oh, you're a horse, horse guy. Yeah. So I just like leveled all my horse characters mm -hmm. um, and didn't ignore all the other characters basically. Mm -hmm. um, and also I couldn't beat the final boss without. Um, he was anti horse without using the. Uh, no, you had to you had to use the lords to beat the final boss. Are they they're like specific um, characters? Yeah, the lords are like the main characters, ah. and you had to use them because only they could equip the weapons that could damage the final boss. <laughs> oh shit! Uh, so you so, were just you were dead. So, uh, you had to. They give you um. They give you like a backup. Oh, that's because they expected cool. this to happen. Yeah, yeah. They give you like a backup that can like sort of cheese the final boss. Anyway, fun, um. Fun. In Golden Sun, for also similarly, I like only ever used. I don't want to get into details, but I, I only ever used like a certain set of the classes. I never explored the other classes. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, the the Dark Souls story, you know, one could easily argue that that is more of an, a game meant for expert gamers, and mm -hmm, you know, I yes. should have known that. And I, I admit, I was a dumbass because I've played it ton of games and uh but i also was playing that one high so get off my back <laughs> uh i mean I, you beat the game right like do you feel like your yeah. your experience was somehow way worse because you didn't know i mean you just felt kind of dumb right but i assume it wasn't like i mean it's a it's, it's already kind of a slow game you gotta you know yeah travel back true. to your place every time you know from the the fire every time you die so i would have appreciated <laughs> sprinting okay but I That's did right. enjoy it. Like if I hadn't known, I wouldn't have even considered that a real problem. I was just thought right. that was the 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 speed you went. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is the uh, busy on screen elements, like uh, you know mm -hmm. the HUD, um, mm -hmm. which when I think about it, doesn't exactly happen in any other context other than games. Correct me if I'm wrong. May maybe military Driving. stuff. Driving. Having a HUD. Yeah, I guess yeah, you're right. You you're right. When you drive, you do on the dash. You do. You're right. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, now that you have a phone, it's like even more busy, right? That's you true. You're GPS right. A lot open. of that would be learned through phone because it's got all that shit mm -hmm. going on. I assume people get to the point where they just ignore all the notifications and things, and it's just it's just too much. Yeah. But uh, I don't know, well, it, these I, days I think it actually varies a lot based on the person. Yeah. I I knew someone in college who was like a total maniac. He set up like he got like uh five notifications a minute because he set up notifications for like everything like he you know how most people like turn off notifications yeah like he like you're getting sought Uber out more notifications, notifications to turn their on new deals yeah. or whatever yeah he like sought out notifications to turn on so he could be on top of everything all the time <laughs> uh and he got like he literally got like five a minute and he said he looked at all of them Jeez. not all when they got them but he looked at every note that's a special kind of brain that guy, that guy was a lunatic yeah I'm the opposite. I, I try to turn every yeah, notification I think, off. I think most people are the opposite. I, I, I also like, uh, I hate apps and programs that have a little number next to them to show you how many emails you have mm, before yep. you open the program. Yep. 
Like, I don't, yeah. I don't want to know that shit. Why, why would that help me? Uh, it just makes me stressed out. Uh, and in yeah. this video about the non-gamers, uh, they, they specifically called out uh, elements of the HUD, like the health bar of the yep. boss, the compass, using the compass at the top mm -hmm. of the screen and waypoints. Mm -hmm. Like uh, that stuff is all, you know, sort of taken for granted now, but can even be confusing once you're used to games. So I can't even imagine how it yeah, is for sure for others. Um, so like, for example, in MMOs, MMOs are a big, uh, have a big problem with this, right? Yeah. Because there's so much that you have to track all the time. Um, yeah. People like, look example, at it like you know, the matrix code. Like it's very hard yeah. to see what's. Oh, I guess like happening. Eve, I've never played this game, but mm -hmm. like Eve, I think is the worst. Eve um, online, the, the, the spaceship yeah. one space game. Yeah. Cause that game, you're just like playing a spreadsheet, right? If I understand correctly, I you just have like I've only watched the big battles where they destroy ships that apparently are worth in-game, <laughs> worth real money somehow. Yeah, that would be an interesting topic too. Actually, the the player run economy, the true player run economy games. Yeah, that, um, that's cool. I don't know a lot about it though. Uh, I used to play Akea Dreams of the Divine Lands, and that is my extent of my knowledge. The um, what now? It's the, it was, I keep, <laughs> I say the full name because I think it's funny, but I think it just confuses everyone. Uh, it's the, it's the mud I used to play as a kid. Oh, right. What, say great. the name again. Achaia Dreams of Divine, Dreams of Divine Lands. Dreams of Divine Lands. Achaia. That's a hard one. Okay. Yeah. Achaia. It's a region in Greece, apparently. Oh. Um, anyway, uh, I, I do think it's, the video mentions specifically this concept that like all of these HUD elements build on top of each other. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and by on top of each other meaning from previous games so like you have a health bar in a shooting game where you only have health right but in the in the you know uh fantasy game now you have the health bar which is still red just like the shooting game but now you have a second bar which is mana so the first time hopefully you one thing builds on top of the other and right uh, and one at a time but if you jump in to the deep end at something then you have a bunch of stuff to learn at once yep Yep. And it's um and it's really no surprise that you know, game developers primarily think from the from this angle. Like, you know, they're they're right. like we are in that they've played games uh throughout their mm -hmm. entire development and these things just get picked up and taken for granted. Uh, and I think you said something very interesting, which is you said whoa. Dark Souls is already a game meant for expert players i'd say right? consider if, yeah or, or at least considered that way yeah and i think that's important because uh, i think it is actually important to sort of classify games that way because um because first of all people that pick up the game will know what they're getting into mm -hmm. right someone who doesn't play games may already know that dark souls is a game that has a reputation of being hard and for experienced gamers and yes so people when, would steer any new player away from it Right, and and the video, in fact, kind of uh, hints at this, right? That like he makes a joke in the video about how you know he really wanted to test the limits of his marriage, so that so they've tried Dark Souls. Yeah, right, right, right. yeah, exactly. Um, and that's I think that's important because that's that's part of having a vision, in my opinion, for your game. Like I think it's very important to have the vision and understand the cost of doing business when you decide that you want to make a game that's for. Uh, for experienced gamers, for experienced yeah. players. I mean, right? and and that lets go ahead. Hmm? I was saying, and that lets you that lets you do more stuff. That lets you be, uh, for example, more uh, you know less put less in the tutorial, right? Uh, which is good for for certain situations. And but you have to understand the cost Death is costs, that new yeah. players are going to have a harder time. And. Uh, generally, we've talked about this before, but executives, companies are almost always going to target an existing player base rather than trying right. through their game to expand players, <laughs> you know, expand right. the player base totally. Because one, right. one, is, one is easier, one is a known quantity, uh, and the other is scary. So it's usually... Uh, really groundbreaking games or consoles that bring in a totally new audience, right? Like Nintendo Minecraft. tries to do this. Like they do a lot of that. Mm. The yep. Wii, the yep. Wii was a conscious attempt to get mm. non-gamers yep. to play games. Wii Sports, yeah, Wii Sports. I mean, I played a ton of that with relatives. Like, yeah, I, exactly. Yep. 
my brother-in-law loved that game. Uh, yeah, my my wife. Yeah, those games are super easy to pick up, and everyone's like, "Oh, I get it really fast." So those are cool. and those are those are important. Like you know, if you if you are the type of person that makes fun of casuals, mm -hmm. uh, you have to understand that those are very important to exist so that they build up this intuition um, that we need to play the harder games. Obviously, we sports is may not necessarily connect directly, but um, I mean, you'll learn some basics, but yeah, it also yeah, has the whole you'll... motion control level uh, layer. Right, over it. right. Uh, uh, actually, speaking of easy games, I wanted to mention uh, Pokemon Go was probably mm -hmm. the game my mm -hmm. wife has played, quote unquote, played the most. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I've seen not quote unquote, she's played it. And uh, it's just, it's, you know, because it's mostly walking around, right? Like that's, yep. that's the... That's sort of the gameplay is going from point to point. And mm -hmm. it really, she found it really uh, compelling because she likes having mm -hmm. an excuse to get more exercise or be outside more. And she likes me having an excuse to do that too. <laughs> uh, so we played that a lot together, but eventually right. the the complicated elements, i.e. Mm. Uh, uh, evolving and managing all of your trash Pokemon and turning them in for candy mm -hmm. and all that, which was like a required thing. That part was just not, not fun. And it was kind of complex. Like you had to concentrate. Mm -hmm. And every time you, I don't know if you played, but every time you did an evolve spree, you do it all at once because you, you basically get to use a little, uh, uh, add on that doubles your experience points for half an hour. Mm -hmm. So you got to mm -hmm. go in there and do all this spreadsheet stuff basically for half an hour to get to get the you know to min max a little bit. And eventually it just became too much to deal with. And she was like, I just don't even want to play this anymore. Very interesting. See, when you started that sentence, I thought you're going to go the opposite direction. Ooh, okay. Where where as you're playing, okay, I, I have a lot to say about this actually. So I thought you were gonna go the opposite direction, which is, you know, as you play, uh, as you put more time into it, um, as you're trying to learn more about the game, you realize that the, the game just lacks the depth to keep you compelled for uh, a year or two years. Yeah, although That's, in this in this case, it is kind of the opposite, right? Like- uh, It is kind of the opposite. She right? wanted the core gameplay to be it. And there were a lot of attached systems that didn't add to the experience for her. It, it made, just made it more onerous. Right. And, and uh, I think that's actually a very interesting um, case study, essentially, right? Because you're right that those systems have nothing to do with the core gameplay. You cannot really affect, like the core gameplay in, in some ways is like completely separate from the rest of the game. Yeah. Um, I mean, you do collect things that let you evolve and stuff, right, but right. yeah, yeah, that's not really what it is about. The right? the going outside and walking around, uh, or like none of the stuff around that gameplay ha involves going outside and walking around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, right. right, exactly. In fact, it specifically um, doesn't. Uh, it's, right, it, it it which I think is is perhaps a you know I'm not super familiar with Pokemon Go. I never played it because I was in China at the time. Uh -huh. But um, uh, we played for my like friends years for like. Four years, maybe. Yeah, Frog, Frog, you know Frog. Frog uh -huh. played it for uh, quite a quite a uh, quite some time, mm -hmm. um, and I, I do know other people that did play it as well. Um, I think that would be an interesting case study. Like what? Like how could they have? Because I think this is a problem. I think Frog, for example, Frog is more of a competitive, uh, high level end game player mm -hmm. um, for most games that he plays. Um, he had the problem I described, which is like the the the. You know, once you play for a year, you lose new stuff to do. You you lose you don't have new challenges anymore, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think and it feels like they kind of hit this uh, sour spot between where they both don't have enough complexity in their system and they don't have enough simplicity in their systems tying into the core gameplay elements mm -hmm. uh... to keep to keep both ends of the spec, you know, the more extreme ends of the spectrum interested. Yeah. And it's, uh, uh, I mean, there's going to be some people, and I think my wife falls into the category of like, she, there may be nothing that ever brings her to that. There probably will never be something that right. brings her to that extra level of complexity, gaming complexity. Right. And because to your point earlier, like she doesn't get those, 
frustration highs or those like I just mm-hmm. pulled off a strategic masterpiece highs, mm-hmm. at least not in the context of a game, because to her and, you know, correctly, <laughs> it's all meaningless mm-hmm. and it's just a waste of time. Yeah. But uh, everything. So it's hard to care about intrinsically, you know, before the everything is meaningless before the heat death of the universe or the rapture, depending on uh, what, what you believe, belie- what, you know, yeah, what you believe in. I'm a rapture guy um, for sure. Big one, big time. <laughs> Did you ever read this whole aside? Did you, did you ever read Lot Left Behind? No, I, I've heard about it, and there's a movie apparently that I was thinking. Yeah, there, of there's. I think there's a TV show and a movie. Anyway, it's How's the book. Uh, that's a that's a different story. I mean, I read them as a kid, but like, oh, you did? Were you religious as a kid? On, oh, I was hyper religious as a kid. Oh, yeah. well, let's. We should talk about this, and we could do it in context of religion and games. Mm-hmm. Oh, sure. Um, adding it. Well, to thing. I don't have that much to say. Well, I guess I, I, I always have stuff to say, but yeah, we can we can talk about. Yeah, you always turn out to have stuff to say. Yeah, I want to talk about religion in context of like uh, Japanese games because they use Christianity as like a they sure do just a just a base of lore, basically. Like they think I, of almost like Nordic mythology at the yes at the same level, which, which is funny, which is what I think they should do. But they're cowards. So I play FGO, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. FGO is part of the Fate universe. Um, they're famous for taking. Obviously, they they take mythological characters and turn them into gr- cute girls, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Um, a good the idea. Cute girls are also usually like fifteen, which is kind of problematic. Uh, but uh-huh. it is Japan, which where the age of consent is different. Um, anyway, I oh, is I right? am is the, the what is the, the age of consent in yeah. Japan? I think it's fifteen. Oh wow! 14. Okay, oof. All right. Yeah. Um, in China, it's thirteen. So you know. uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> see that's that's the american reaction but if you come from a different i know like you but, know yeah because you know I, I i have this thing where it's like you know 18 is not some magical number that you get to and then you're an adult right? i mean i know that but um, also you can yeah, think of I, people I, that age in your life yes and of course you would not want uh, them to be mixed up with an adult you know absolutely 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 agree but neither kids are fucking neither really would you say 18 year olds right Um, no yeah not really (laughs) 25 uh, maybe 25 maybe yeah i think once you get past drinking age you're you're probably you're if you haven't sank by then or if you haven't learned to swim by then then there's not too much society can do for you yeah if you sink yeah uh this is a (laughs) yeah let's stop this might get some people in trouble um (laughs) i was gonna say i am i am number one uh i i have a uh, I have an open petition out that they should make a uh, female Jesus. Oh, okay. You, and if, you've and you've uh, uh, no, I've not created such a petition. Oh, okay. no, no, no. But uh, this is my this is my stance. Mm-hmm. They need to add female Jesus to the game, or they're cowards. Yeah, of course. Uh, Do they have Muhammad? No, they don't have any religious figures. Ah, okay. Um, I mean, only like religious, like uh, um, only like pagan religions, like. Yeah, mythology. something no no groups are going to be up in arms about. Yeah, and like historical religious, uh, like conquerors or whatever, like uh, like yeah. Charlemagne, right, is kind of a like religious or like John John Dark, Joan of Arc mm-hmm, is mm-hmm. like a religious figure, but uh, not not to the point where they're like a core religious uh, entity. But they need- right, right. And uh, it's what were we talking about? I mean, that's uh. Just that uh, Japanese games use Christianity as a as sort of a not a framing a theme <laughs> like a, a motif a motif yeah yeah exactly exactly yep. uh, yeah I feel like a lot that of was games, like the second tangent and a oh, lot okay, of games have uh, ref- refer to God in the mm-hmm. Japanese sense but when they come to mm-hmm. English speaking countries it kind of takes on a different meaning. Because of uh, sort of the breadth of godlike creatures in Japanese uh, culture versus total monotheism, but anyway, this is this is all side tangent. I don't know if we want to go down this path, so I'll, I'll, well, I'll let's, stay let's, silent for now. <laughs> okay, let's do it later for another one. So let's get back to uh, uh, non-gamer stuff. Um, Mm-hmm. Speaking of, t- <laughs> I'm going to do a small tangent. One <laughs> of the of other tangents. like established gaming conventions that I hate, I hate very much is uh, Rumble or sometimes called haptic feedback. Mm-hmm. Haptic feedback. It's when your controller jiggles around like a vibrator. Yep. Uh, 
and it supposedly makes games a little bit more um, feels like you're in the game, puts you in the game a mm-hmm. little more immersive. Uh, like when you shoot your gun, you'll have a little mm-hmm. little feedback of the the yep. report. What do you call that? Uh, recoil. Uh, 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 recoil. Yeah, the recoil. Like or course. if there's a there's a big explosion on screen, it'll it'll rattle around. And I guess for a lot of people, when that happens, it it heightens the experience and focuses that it like makes it seem mm-hmm. more real. For me, it it takes my attention away from the screen and down to my hands in a way that totally takes me out of everything. So. Uh, it's weird to me, to me, it's like, it's an insane, <laughs> it's an insane uh, feature to have on by default in everything. Like that oh, is man, I just so some, strange to me. I just had some ideas. But first of all, I want to say this, uh, you know, I assume that you also have this feature turned off on your phone. Um, my phone vibrates because, when it rings. Uh, well, yeah, but uh, so by default, yeah, by default, the keyboard has haptic feedback. Uh, I don't even know if what? you've ever had this experience. Oh, but, uh, on the yeah, iPhone? In most phones, uh, I don't know about the iPhone. Okay. Um, but on most Android phones, by default, the keyboard has haptic feedback. So when you have the on-screen keyboard and you're typing, when you press a key, it does a very, very small rumble. What? What? Um, why? Is that good? Why? So the reason, the reason is because for people who are not uh, well, first of all, oh, like um, hitting a real. If keyboard. you're used to typing with a key, yeah, it's like exactly. It's like hitting a key. Yeah, right? because you get a little bit of feedback to to kind of make you feel that you're actually you actually press the button correctly. Yeah, right? I, I get that. Yeah, it's um. I mean, that is a problem of touch screens, right? Is that uh, you right. need that response like we're used to with a button? And I, um, are, are you, you know, I, I'm sure. I'm sure there's been research in this, but I, I would assume that the purpose of haptics in gaming is, uh, especially with controllers, is very similar. Um, the goal is to have, you know, give you feedback to make you understand that when you press the button, something happened, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it strengthens you, the idea that you just did something. But you bring up a really interesting point, which is this idea that, like, when you understand the game, you have a picture, you have a mental model already of what's going on in the game, right? You don't need any connection between what you're doing and what's in the game because you already have a complete model of what's happening, right? Like, you know, you're no longer thinking about as, how as do I As someone who plays games. Yes. Okay. Uh, right? You're no longer thinking about uh, how do I attack? It's like, oh, when I uh, look at this gun that I'm shooting. Uh, I guess that's a good that's a good example, right? Because like what you get to a certain point where um, the visuals no longer matter. Right, it's more about the problem the game is presenting and how you're solving it. If that okay. Makes sense. Uh, you're to no me, longer looking that's at, how I'm looking at right. it. Yes. Okay. To to an experienced to an experienced to someone who is quote unquote a gamer, right? Mm-hmm. To someone who's experienced playing games. Uh, at some point, I, I do agree. I do think that this is a um, this kind of universal. Like once you put enough time into a game, you're no longer looking at the the visuals. You're thinking about the model of what the problem is that's being being presented to you yeah i mean even right. even unconsciously although you know i do yeah. try specifically to pull myself away from that when i'm mm-hmm. watching a or rather playing a very cinematic game yeah like i try yes. to get into movie mode where i'm like i i don't know try to get myself to not know what to expect and not what the tropes yeah. are yeah so i think the fact that you have to do this thing where you pull yourself out of playing the game into looking at the game um, mm-hmm. is already something that that's like that uh, being able to consciously do that and realize you're doing that and even create such a model where you're thinking about the game is something that takes a long time to build up for someone who isn't used to playing the game for sure yeah um, it's kind of like one example is like kind of like playing chess right like grandmasters can play chess without looking at in fact they find it easier to visualize a position without looking at the board Right. Oh, really? Wow. Uh, yeah, um, because they're thinking of changes to the board. And well, there's probably many reasons, but I imagine one of the reasons is they're thinking of changes to the board and it's easier to, they have a strong enough mental model of what it will look like. Uh, and they're not literally just moving the pieces in their mind, right? They're kind of looking at systems. Um, mm-hmm. Or perhaps a better example is like is like magic players, right? 
And in fact, this is probably a better example. So in Magic, uh, when you're testing a new deck, mm -hmm. you uh, instead of buying the cards that you want to test, because you don't know if you want them yet, you'll just write the name of the card right, on right. a different card, right? Um, you don't need to read the text. You don't need to think about what they do. You don't even need to look at the art or anything. Um, you're in your mind, you understand the system that this goes into and kind of you're able to make decisions based on that rather than anything visual. And I think that's where the haptics, uh, where people that don't like haptics approach it, which is like the haptics interrupt the act of playing the game, quote unquote, mm -hmm. by forcing you back into a, a, uh, a physical connection, right? When you've kind of transcended the physical level you know, you've yeah. become enlightened. I've turned and now, <laughs> yes. Yes. I've <laughs> avatar all the way into the yeah. uh, Sonic or whoever. Um, One thing I just want to mention as an aside that's come out recently, there's been this meme about how like, um, uh, how like VR my games will take over video games because, uh, because they're more realistic. And I think this is, this core idea is kind of why that's kind of a ridiculous statement. Like gamers, People that play a lot of games don't play games because they're more or less realistic, right? In yeah, fact, that's actually, don't, that seems like a common misunderstanding of gaming. Right, exactly. Uh, it's very, uh, one of the jokes I've made about this is that like, uh, you know, movies will replace books because movies have pictures on them. That right, right. Look, right, and that has not, I mean, and those two are not much more up. closely related than a VR game versus a, a game, right? But yeah. Uh, once you play games, you realize this idea that like you're not, you know, you don't even care about the visuals at all if you enjoy the act of playing the game. In mm. in most in many cases, right? Yeah. Obviously, there's tons of exceptions, but uh, if you think about yeah, what's going nice. when you get really immersed into a game, you you lose the visual aspect entirely often. Yeah, and uh, that's another thing that marketing makes worse is uh, mm. you know with all the marketing for uh, so-called triple A triple A games and realistic graphics and things like that. Right. I think a uh, certain subset of people d uh, ha has trouble recognizing a, you know, a nice visual design or a new art style that isn't 3D. Uh, mm -hmm. I think of a time way back when during the, what was it? It must have been the GameCube where I was in a Best Buy at the time. You could buy video games in Best Buy and not online. Uh, wow. <laughs> so I was in a Best Buy Best browsing Buy. games and uh, I overheard there was a demo station playing Zelda Oh wait I totally remember this dude I used to sorry to totally derail your tangent fuck? but <laughs> I used to I totally forgot I used to do this I used to like beg my parents to go to Best Buy so I could play the demos oh sure like, all oh, the yeah, time because we didn't have shit. consoles right and or yeah. or uh, for a long time even a computer i could use or internet so like i would just like take me to best buy I, I would just like sit there and play one summer i worked at uh it's like a best buy clone it's called comp usa mm -hmm. uh that i worked there for a summer and that was just before the dreamcast came out and they had a dreamcast demo station and i would like use my break time to play, <laughs> to play on that sounds like a dream job oh yeah dreamcast job uh <laughs> Anyway, yeah, Sonic Sonic games. Adventure One. That was I was just, okay. I was blown away by that game. Mm. Uh, anyway, let's get back on track a little bit. Uh, anyway, haptics suck. I think we all agree. Um, oh, I actually like haptics. Oh, so you do like it? <laughs> I do. Uh, to to some extent, I do not like recoil feedback or anything like that. But uh, that I like the. Uh, so obviously it's a spectrum, right? But I like um, I like the sort of mini micro feedback you get from typing on your touch screen and i think oh, some okay. games do that level where it's like uh where it's just when you do an input it does a little bit of feedback it doesn't really try to make it realistic it's more just a physical it's it's like typing with a mechanical keyboard almost mm. you get like yeah i mean uh, this is uh <laughs> our, uh the people we hang out with have including you have many have deep opinions on mechanical keyboards i actually don't have that many uh oh. i'm uh, but I do, I was an early adopter of mechanical keyboards. I was on the train way back before these people were even born. So, and it's something I've never I'm, even thought about. Yeah. I've, I'm behind the, I'm behind the eight ball now. So you like that, that typing stuff. Do you keep on the, the audio clicks as well when you hit 
letters? No, I don't. I usually just have audio muted. Um, yeah. Aside from Good. aside from uh, music, I'm actually not that into audio. Like people will talk about like sound design. I'm just like, eh, you know, whatever. Um, Do you play music love, while you play games? Uh, um, it depends. Uh, usually, no. Usually, I'll have a YouTube video open mm -hmm. on the side or a stream. Um, but I do sometimes play music when I play games. And sometimes I do, now that I have a Steam Deck and I play in a setting away from my computer where I can't really play a video in the background, um, I mm -hmm. do listen to some game music. Um, but it's not a, definitely not a priority for me. I'll definitely play games with the sound off while I'm listening to a right. podcast. Yeah, or even same. like watching That's... a Twitch something or other. Yep. That's and so very unlike, much the, same unlike thing. the early days, uh, I. So when I. If you're talking about Nintendo and PlayStation and Super Nintendo and all that shit, uh, if you gave me a video game music quiz, I would probably do pretty well for those consoles. Mm -hmm. But now everything in the modern era. I'll hear the music once or twice and all the sound, but then I'll probably, if it's re repetitive, I'll just turn on while I'm playing. Right. So I don't, I don't have that video game ear mu music uh, ear anymore. Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, for me, that, that was almost out of necessity because uh, on the Game Boy Color and Advance, mm -hmm. your battery drained quite fast if you had the sound on. Oh, so that, is why that makes I, sense. I used to play with sound off. And also uh, for the emulators back in the, oh, uh, never mind. I guess I, I don't think. I guess I, I don't think any. Even, I don't think anyone's going to sue us the, about some emulators you got any, in college. I guess. I guess we might be outside of the statue of liberty limitations. Yeah, statue, at this point. statue of liberty. Yeah. All right. Uh, so even for the emulators I used as a kid, they didn't. My computers weren't good enough, and probably the technology wasn't good enough mm -hmm. to run it uh, very well if the music was on. So. Oh, interesting. Uh, Actually, I, I, I feel played. like I may have encountered that a couple times too. Yeah. Uh, I want to mention I I remember the introduction of rumble to games with the do you remember the n64 rumble pack uh i do know this name but i do not know it went the technology. it went in that slot in the back of the oh, wait there was a slot how did it get in there <laughs> i don't know there was no, some there way was, to right? there's like a little hole in the back of the n64 control oh okay then that's that's it uh yeah you had to plug it in so. and it, ha it was like battery powered too yeah, yeah, so yeah. you had to like replace the batteries some now and then and it came with Star Fox 64 so every time you shot and every time there's an explosion it would rumble around and at first i was like oh this is really cool and by the end i was like get get this thing away from get this thing away from me that is that's honestly a lot of like disruptive visuals are the same way, mm -hmm. right? Like the very first time you see, uh, so for example, a good example is like a cutscene. Like if you play, like you speed run, right? Mm -hmm. For a speed runner, the first time you play through the game, quote unquote, as intended, and you see a cutscene, you're like, oh, this is cool. I played the game to see this cutscene, right? But yeah, a lot of people, yeah. If you do it again, right? Uh, if, and then again and again, then very quickly, it loses all its meaning and it's just an obstacle. Yeah, it's just that time you got to sit there unless you can skip it. And I feel like, you know, visual things like things that are way too bright or giant explosions or rumble, um, loud sounds may all fit those categories. Well, at least visuals can clue you in on where to go and stuff. I feel like, you know what? The only haptic feedback... I'm going to stop saying that because that's just I, I've never heard haptic in any other context. The only, <laughs> the okay. only reason... The rumbling, uh, uh, the only way I like that is when there's like a game where, I don't know, in the game you get a, a magic staff that that mm. shakes when you're standing on top of a treasure <laughs> or something like that. I, uh, I kind of okay. like that sure. implementation. They have it in Super sure. Mario Galaxy, yeah. actually, that, that exact implementation. Uh, Makes sense. That I had to go into the settings and turn back on the rumble to, to play. Anyway, let's, uh, <laughs> let's keep moving because we're... All right, we're behind on some stuff. Uh, skip that. So yeah, tight ship over here. We can talk. Yeah, tight ship. Well, I, you know, I can only talk this intelligently for a certain amount of time. <laughs> That's true. And blow people away. Uh, let's talk a little about uh, the difference between PC games and console games with learning. Mm. Uh, the control, which comes down to the controller, right, versus. Keyboard and mouse, yep. although it doesn't come down just to that. Uh, there's the advantage computer, 
in that people normally use keyboard and mouse in their day to day nowadays. So you are subconsciously learning how to play PC games somewhat. Whereas my wife will never encounter a uh, a controller in any context for any reason except yep. to run Netflix off our PS4. <laughs> okay, fair. Um, and uh, on the other hand, uh, I consoles have the huge advantage of uh, you download it or you just put in the disc and it just works. You don't have to worry about drivers mm -hmm. and all the tweaking that would... It's a thing on PC that would drive people away pretty and fast, I would think. Perhaps most importantly, you don't have to worry about hardware. Exactly. Right? This yeah, is less a... of a problem these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it? This is less of a problem these days. Uh, I, I think so. Like, I think the, well, if you have a Mac, maybe not still, but I think it should be close enough. Like, p things are pretty, p things are pretty good about being interoperable now. But like back in the day, if you had, a, like the vast majority of laptops didn't have any kind of graphics card, like dedicated GPU. Mm -hmm. So you, if you didn't understand what that meant and you try to play a game on a laptop, which is what most people had. Um, yeah, you'd be like, what, what's going on here? It did it's not work. Barely yeah. moves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, I remember those days when I was like uh, staying with a relative or something and, <laughs> and like played on their shitty computer <laughs> yep. or yep. laptop, exactly. my stepmom's laptop. Uh, which was black and white and had like trails behind any animation. Oh, that's even see my, one of my first laptops was this like two inch thick think book mm -hmm. that my pastor gave to me. Okay. Um, back to the religious podcast. Yeah. My pastor was super into building computers actually, oh, okay. which is, uh, uh, just, anyway, I, yeah, I got this like literally inch and a half, two inch thick, thick think book. Wow. IBM think book, think pad. Uh, uh I don't ThinkPad. know. From like, yeah. 1990 something probably um, yeah and that certainly could not run most things i'm pretty sure i played on a thinkpad i remember playing connecting to CompuServe for the first time and playing their included games uh anyway so these two anyway there's a oh go ahead oh i i want to say something uh there's a third paradigm mm. there's um there's controller there's keyboard and mouse uh touch screen and then there's a touch screen yes yeah, I mean, going back to the Pokemon Go, my wife already kind of knew how to do all that stuff because it's just yep. pressing buttons on the phone, which you're totally used yep. to. There's no triangles. And to be fair, that's very similar. Yeah, there's it's very similar to uh, to PC, right? But the touchscreen is often even simpler because it, it often comes with the advantages of, of uh, console already there, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because you already don't, generally speaking, don't have to worry about hardware or will it work or anything like that mm -hmm. uh, compared to PC. Yes. I remember back in the old days of early PC games, learning all kinds of like programming basics just to get games oh, yeah. to run. Oh, yeah. I remember well, editing you... <laughs> uh, any files. What does that stand for? Uh, initialize? Yeah. Any. Uh, uh, they're actually just text files. Oh, uh, right, okay. Not, but... And then, uh, yeah. you know, going to buffer equals 30 and changing it to 50 for some reason. Uh, you know, I don't know. To be fair, you still have to do that, right? Because sometimes, sometimes yeah, DOS it's, box it's, games. it yeah. drives me nuts. That and yeah. uh, how computers give you the uh, desktop interface like a minute or two before you can actually use it. That's always strange to me. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, no. <laughs> When you first turn on a computer, <laughs> you know how it's usually okay. like loading the background programs for like a okay. minute. But I I know that in the context of like 2012, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I had that your, problem for a while. Great computer, yeah. Is that it? Okay. I I do yeah I do have a more powerful computer than I used to in 2012. All right. Well, fine. But no, I I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Uh, there's computers also computers are. So going back to the controller thing, there's also, like we talked about the um, Jammer Lammy example, the button prompts on mm -hmm. screen. If you got to look down every time you do that, you're, you're going to have a bad time in a, in a fast paced game. And then yeah. there's of course the trigger type buttons, which are confusing and the even mm -hmm. more mysterious L3 R3, which is, you know, mm. pushing the analog sticks down towards yep. the controller, uh, which even gaming people are often confused by it because it's oh, yeah. very specific usage and it's a hard one even to display on the screen like what you're supposed to do because it's such an unusual mm -hmm. use of that stick. Uh, so yeah. This is where, so 
a couple things. This is where we talked about this in our first fighting game discussion about button economy, mm -hmm. right? In other words, like reusing buttons for the same thing. Um, I think Sakurai, the uh, Smash developer, Kirby developer, mm -hmm. uh, creative director, um, he has a video about context the importance of contextual buttons. Mm. Like if uh, a lot of old games do this very well, where it's like the A button does a bunch of stuff has a has like 10 different functions but you can kind of determine what that is based on the context mm -hmm. right um say so like game boy like old games that had to do this because there's only two buttons um do generally do a good job of this this is okay. where uh yeah this is where it helps to be very mindful of making sure that you only use the buttons that you need to use right you make a yeah game because is this similar to the discussion about how smash uses be up and down and yeah uh, to yep, simplify exactly. it and they, they they map the the moves onto those sorts of directions right mm -hmm. yeah exactly um and you know back in that discussion it was like well street fighter does this even better quote unquote because instead of just up down left right now you have all these arcane directional inputs you can do um mm -hmm. but that's obviously a separate discussion that we've already had uh, but anyway yeah I, I think controller uh keyboard nicely gets around this issue completely mm -hmm. right because um you you have all the buttons you could ever need and everyone knows where they are mostly um, yes they may not be used to uh you know putting their hand over wasd and sort right. of understanding right. how that moves you uh still walking and looking around with the mouse even though it's much more natural because you're used to the mouse than the control over the controller it's still that experience is still hard right to learn right uh right. oh that you know who was telling me maybe maybe it was part of this video because he played portal as well oh right and she mm -hmm. discovers it later but i was uh just last weekend i was talking to someone who doesn't play a lot of games but is playing with her fiance mm -hmm. to to bond at least for now <laughs> uh and they're playing Portal, or she's playing Portal in rep in preparation for them playing Portal Two. Oh, yeah. Okay. And the reason he's Seems convoluted, but all right. Well, the reason, he, well, that's a co-op game, right? You know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. But the the reason he picked Portal is because there's never, or there's rarely times where you have to hurry. You know, there's no enemies trying to bite mm. you or whatever. Yep. yep. Uh, but still, she says, you know, she's still moving then looking moving then looking you know because mm -hmm. this is not not natural for the other part yeah uh it is uh that, that that just is something that you just have to build up over time right like yeah for me and probably for you it's like we don't even remember when the last time we were confused about moving and looking where because we've mm -hmm. done it basically for our entire like conscious yeah it's, existence. it's a, this natural thing a natural this this learned thing that uh is only useful in this context. I mean, I guess if there are future virtual worlds too, but uh, yeah. And honestly, if you if you talk to like, especially someone, for example, who might be young and aggressive and on Reddit, uh -huh. they often will just not believe you that like this is hard, right? Because they they oh right yeah it's, it's just so obvious. I mean, you right? know, if you get to the Reddit thing, like how hard could it be? You literally just move your move your mouse and doing look this around. Like, what is so hard about it from the delivery room yeah uh, uh, but empirically it is it is complicated it's not something that's necessarily yeah and easy. while we're on the subject yeah the the whole analog stick thing and the the mousing keyboard looking and moving uh, it's it's it is required for 3d gaming like there's no mm -hmm. there are very few games that don't require that if you're going to have a first person perspective or that kind of game and i I had a, a sort of a natural ramp up where I started with a directional pad. When the 64 came out, I played a ton of Mario and Goldeneye. And I remember first getting Mario out of the box and using that analog stick and feeling like I was totally out of control. Like I could not make him go in a straight line. Mm -hmm. I couldn't make it do what I wanted for a long time. And that was one stick. And then later, yeah. Uh, I actually put it off for a while until finally I got, uh, I actually put off playing a lot of 3D games for a while until somebody got me okay. into Halo where I finally got good at Ooh. the sticks uh, at, at 
two sticks. And then from there, it's just like, you got it. Yep. And I think, uh, so like I said, I actually don't even, well, I, like, I didn't have that many uh, console games, obviously, or access to them, but I still can't, I couldn't even remember or tell you when, uh, like, ever struggling with movement. Like, somehow it happened early enough, uh, or maybe I'm just uh, that good. Yeah, it might be a um, savant. Does, uh, uh, how early did you play games? Do you remember the age? uh, Play games? So, the first memory I have, generally, of, like, uh, access to games was like I was like five or six mm-hmm. and I saw my uncle playing games and then I think I said this in our in episode one but like then my life just ended right like all like the only interest I had since then was like <laughs> there was another path that part. was no longer being yeah. taken uh, but so yeah I played a couple games on his like computer uh, but that was rare and then the first game I can remember playing was on the Game Boy the original Game Boy um, okay Okay. So I I couldn't that I can't I couldn't really tell you when my first experiences with like moving with an analog stick were. Oh uh, sure. But I I don't have a memory of it being like super challenging. So I mean, as a person that doesn't play many shooters or games like that, are you worse at it or do you? Oh play yeah, enough? like I can't. Oh. Uh, so right now, so recently I played. Um, are you familiar with the game Mountain Blade Banner Lord? No. Um, uh, anyway, it's like a it's like a medieval-ish fighting game. Sure. Uh, not no 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 no. That's that's totally wrong. That's no. that's all the wrong words. Great. It's like a it's like a medieval-ish uh, 3D combat game. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, well, there's actually it's not a combat game, but there's uh, there's combat in it. And in the combat, you move. You're like first person or third person. Yeah. And you sort like you can have a bow and you aim with this. Uh, well, usually with the mouse. But I've been playing on Steam Deck. Uh-huh. And, oh, and uh, it has like a touchpad thing, right? How is that? It has a touchpad. Uh, that's basically a joystick. Uh-huh. Um, it it basically functions as a joystick. But anyway, it's uh, like I can't play bow. Uh, I can't shoot a bow uh, very well. <laughs> so I kind of just gave up on that. Yeah, that's uh, fair. Well, yeah, so I'm, not, I'm I mean, not really good at it. Having to use that instead of a mouse must be very frustrating instead for of a, a mouse, PC right? player. Yeah, exactly. It is just frustrating because it's like, I could just use oh, a mouse. That's what that's it was. What I want to do anyway. I had committed to 3D games on PC and had ah, like, in college, yeah. I didn't buy any uh, consoles and I just played at friends' houses and reluctantly learned because I wanted to compete. Right, right. Makes sense. But yeah, I was playing... Team Fortress Classic and CS 1.6 uh, before that, I think. So <laughs> Me too. I also played CS 1.6. We probably saw each other on there. Very, very badly. Uh, no, I, I highly doubt it. I don't think I ever played online except oh. one time. I played a ton um, and I was never good. Uh, same. Moving forward, there's the concept of getting too much info uh, so that you only retain some of it or even, yep. and this was an interesting point of that video, is that you can actually, new new players especially, can learn the wrong lessons from things. Mm-hmm. Uh, he gave the example of Celeste, where yep. uh, you have to first use the air dash in a diagonal direction. And mm-hmm. his wife, after learning that, assumed that you had to go diagonal rather than right. the truth, which you can go in any direction with a dash. Right. Uh, Although, do you have any? Does, do any examples pop to mind for you for this one? Um. So it's so. Uh, w- one thing I want to say here, which is also the point made in the video, is that it's pretty rare to make it that far by yourself. Where right? you're learning the wrong um, lessons. By right, where where you're inexperienced with games and you're just on your own the whole time and you make it all the way to a point where it, it becomes a problem. Okay, meaning right. like normally if you're totally new, someone else is probably playing with you? Normally the right. Normally, you start playing a game because someone else, like your friend, is playing the game, yeah. right? And you're like playing together and they're like showing you what to do. Um, or you start playing a game by yourself because it looks interesting, but then you get frustrated and then you quit because you don't have anyone else. Right, do. right. It's pretty rare to make it, like I think he even said this, that it's like... Um, a lot of those things only happened because they were running this experiment. Right? Yes, um, he couldn't. He couldn't jump in and say anything. Uh, but yeah, uh, a lot of these lessons, there's like levels to this kind of lesson, right? So there's the actual technical aspect, but you see this a lot with strategic aspects. So once you kind of evolve past the point of 
Uh, so fighting games, you see this a lot, right? Once you evolve past the point of like knowing your controls, um, the first time you go outside your bubble, uh, you often get shown a lot of things that you're doing are totally wrong. Mm -hmm. When you get into like the community guided into the meta, basically. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, you may have you may have been like, building oh, well, up the building up the wrong yeah. muscle memory. So I have a great example. Uh, as a kid, I used to go to my friend's house and we play Super Smash Brothers Melee. Mm -hmm. I would pick Fox, uh, but we did. I didn't know anything about the game really, except uh, I did. You know, I had the general idea that like Fox was good because of like competitive reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so we play with items on and stuff, and I would just spam up B. Like I would just do up B and I would just aim it at my friend and he got really mad. He was like, I'm not playing with you anymore if you just spam up B. At he me. couldn't beat you? He couldn't beat me. Uh, yeah, he couldn't beat the strategy, right? So that's that's kind of the example I had where it's like, well, obviously uh, at this point, now that you understand, that's kind of like button mashing almost, right? Yeah. Like as soon as you Just like I can do this develop, one thing, I'm just going to do that. Yeah. Um, once you kind of... Uh, you can learn the wrong lessons because the feedback you get is that you win, but winning doesn't necessarily mean winning against everybody. Speaking of which, we did give this similar example in the the fighting game episodes about, uh, yeah, like playing with a friend or mm -hmm. playing with the computer versus playing yeah. online are sometimes totally different uh, sets of strategies. And... Mm -hmm. I remember growing up with the, the the SNES version of Street Fighter Two, and just playing my friends all the time. So, right. for example, I remember uh, I was better at gauging the distance of throws, and uh, for some for a while, my one of my buddies was just like weak against throws. He just like didn't factor them into his gameplay enough. So I just exploited right. that. None of that's gonna <laughs> none of that's gonna help me when I get into the arcade or anything like that. I'm gonna in fact, if I'm right. so used to always going for the throw, my muscle memory is going to be uh, doing bad habits for me. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And yeah. it's uh, if you get too deep in the weeds, you have to overcome this muscle memory, and that can be a different type of frustration. Right? Yep. Yep. Um, uh, one thing that's interesting that's come out of this is this idea that like there is there is a there's kind of like a barrier that you have to cross uh so at, at one on one side you're sort of learning to actually play the game right perform the actions in the game this is where a new gamer often gets stuck right mm -hmm. uh sorry i i think we should ban the word gamer a new uh a new player mm -hmm. often gets stuck yeah player right because it's like oh well i first i have to learn to look around and then i have to learn to click this and it's like oh uh, so portal i guess is a good example right it's like um it takes a long time it sounds like your example is similar it takes a long time before you can just focus on solving the puzzle yep yep right um obviously you're still solving the puzzle along the way but you you can't really focus on it until you kind of master you have you reach some level of mastery of the of the actual controls yep uh, but once you cross this um in in my opinion and i think uh, in a lot of empirical examples, once you cross this barrier is kind of when, quote unquote, the game actually starts, right? When you actually start playing games, I'm, when you're I'm actually uh, doing... Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. When you start, when you're no longer struggling with how to do anything, when you have access to the tools at your disposal, more or less, yes. obviously it's a, it's a bit of a spectrum, right? Um, but you're able to kind of put your focus on uh, solving what the game presents to you or achieving your goals within the game and less on figuring out what to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, new new players have that learning experience every time if they're not yes. practicing. Every everything. time a new... And, and to some degree, we all have that new experience every time we fire up a new game, right? Especially if it's a game, if it's a category uh, or a scheme that we're not super familiar with. But... Um, obviously, new players have that for a lot longer than I've than noticed experience. that. I've noticed that if I am playing, I don't play as many games these days. But when I'm playing two games of the same genre, mm. uh, it doesn't work very well. Like I, yep. I'm playing an action adventure. I got to play through that first. You know, I got to play Breath of the Wild before I play Horizon because the mm -hmm. the 
the difference in buttons, the difference in, uh, you know, movement speed and weapon speed and all that stuff is, is going to be yep. different. And there's a little bit of getting into the groove each, each with each mm -hmm. game. It's like jarring and frustrating when your muscle memory, because like, at, you know, what, what we kind of mean when we say cross this line is that you cross into the point where your controls are muscle memory, right? Where you don't have to think about it yep. and then you can just do what you want to do. And then your brain is freed up to focus on the game. Uh, well, it's very jarring when you're in that zone, but then your muscle memory does something you don't expect it to. And then you have to like pull yourself out of that zone and back into the think about your control zone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, and then you're not playing the game. This is a, um, so in, uh, in a lot of times in, uh, especially like fighting games, people switch controllers mm -hmm. or control schemes. Uh -huh, this yeah. is one of the biggest hurdles to doing that, right? Because all of a sudden you have to rewire your entire brain. You, you have to rewire kind of the, the physical connections. Yep. And you got right? your mental connections are the same, you don't, but you don't get to build them up the same way. It's similar when um, in WoW or Final Fantasy, you like change your hotkeys. I had this problem because I got hand pain while playing Final Fantasy XIV. Ooh. And then um, I had to like totally rewire my controls to be more ergonomic. And then I was, just, I almost quit the, well, I almost quit the game like immediately because I was like, I really just don't want to rewire everything I learned. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, you did? I did. <laughs> uh, but the thing, you know, I guess the point is like for a new player, that way, the way you feel in that moment, mm -hmm. I guess this is important for a game developer to remember, right? The way you feel in that moment where you have to relearn all your controls for something you've done for a long time is how a new player feels all the time. Yep. Yeah. Right. And it's just like, ugh, this is going to be a pain in the ass. And for, yeah, exactly. for some exactly. amount of time, if you ever play with someone else or in the computer, you're, you're going to, you're going to screw up. You're going to feel like you're yep. worse just because of that. Yep. Um, yep. Let's talk a little about the perception of games versus reality with regards to limited choices. Uh, he, mm, in the video, okay. they talk about That's this a, a lot of how a non-gamer seeing games or hearing how they're talked about may have the impression that you can do more in games than you really can mm -hmm. or that you have much more freedom of choice. Because, you know, all the advertising is usually about like, you know, yep. go every, go anywhere, do anything, you know, you're yep. in command, yep. all that stuff. But once yep. you actually get into the game, yeah, you, sound, you sound a lot like a marketing director. Right <laughs> get now. into the game. <laughs> uh, run, jump and eat as Po the Kung Fu Panda. Uh, mm. You know, I worked on the Kung Fu Panda video game. Oh, which, uh, which console? Uh, all consoles because it was a kid's licensed game. Oh. I see. That's cool. Uh, Xbox 360 was the main I see. skew. I see. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, limited limited choices. Like we've we've gotten used to the idea that, or what we've gotten used to as a player, what mm -hmm. uh, unique choices are, or uh, developing relationships with characters. Like we know mm -hmm. from playing games that. It's not like I'm going to be able to romance every single character. It's not like I'm going to... That's what you think. <laughs> well, without mods. Uh, I'm not going to be able <laughs> to um, even play this strategic moment the way I'm... Like, I may see yep. uh, a, a bunch of uh, explosive barrels hanging from the ceiling or whatever, but they didn't program that in. So if I shoot at it, it's yep. just going to go ting, ting and do nothing. And I'll be like, oh, why, yep. why didn't that work? And... I've encountered this many times playing with my wife where she's like, oh, well, can I do this thing that I would do in real life to solve this problem? Right. Yes. Uh, exactly. And this goes back to our quest for glory stuff. But uh, uh, when I'm like, no, no, it's just it's just not made that way. And she's like, oh, well, she, she always says like, that's dumb. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, right, it's kind that's of dumb. But, very reasonable. But reasonable it's uh, expression. kind of just how it is because of how you make games. Right, and, and uh, this is this is a topic close to my heart. I really, um, I think a lot of it is not a necessity necessarily, mm -hmm. um, but that might be a topic for a future show where we can explore ways to sort of break these kind of barriers. Um, I have one one word for you mm -hmm. that summarizes my thoughts uh, or gives an example of what I think. 
Scribble Knots. Scribble Are you familiar with Scribble Knots? I'm very familiar. I was very excited for that game. Oh yeah. And so was or Spore. I guess Spore is a bit of a lesser example, but I mean Scribble Knots, I think if you want to talk marketing hype, that that's a big one. <laughs> Spore. Yeah. But like Scribble Knots basic in my opinion, like perfectly encapsulates what you just described, right? Mm-hmm. Like Scribble Knots is literally a game where it's like you can write almost any semantic word in English and it will create the object. But it doesn't actually work that way. But yeah, but it doesn't mean that the object you create is going to work as you expect right. or can be used exactly. to solve the puzzle in front of you, right? Yes. And in the end, you end up going to the things that work, the things that yeah. the programmer or the developers put in on purpose. Like even if you create a, what you consider to be a semantic solution, like, oh, I can build a bridge over this and then from the bridge, I can hang a pulley, whatever, right? Uh, you quickly... Uh, understand like you said that uh it you know the systems are pretty linear uh, yeah which is a word that i will use a lot which is um there there are uh, in, in in software engineering we usually call them hard-coded that's not necessarily a fair uh, assessment of what happens here but it's like a hard-coded singular solution yeah um it's like a parameter or a number that you have to get a certain way right and it's not free in the sense um and some that sense that that makes sense and some uh some games like sandbox games are known for Mm -hmm. or advertised about as like you are playing within a system so sometimes you will have when they're done well uh all the systems of the game work together to give you more options essentially for what you're trying to do yes often in like a game like GTA, the object of the thing is GTA, just to kill yeah. somebody or to uh, steal a car. So there's mm-hmm. sometimes only limited things that can get you there. But if you're trying to escape the police, you can hop onto a boat or even take yep. an airplane or yep. you know go through traffic and run over people. Uh, and well, that doesn't usually help you. Escape you have the police, to go but... and run over people uh, <laughs> okay. and then open fire on it. the police. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in the game, in the game, in the game. Uh, so, uh, of course. Uh, and uh, this reminds me of when I first played uh, Grand Theft Auto 3 on the PlayStation 2 with friends in high school. Uh, we liked trying to find alternate ways to beat levels. And for a while, we were trying to beat every level by blocking the computer-controlled characters wherever we could with a fire truck. So we'd bring a fire truck to every single mission and see if we could use it to basically cheese it. So like uh, it blocks an entire tunnel and then the AI controlled car can't go through it and you can just blow it away. So this is, uh, that's a great example. That really makes me think of this idea about realism in games, Mm -hmm. right? People that find a lot of joy in doing that kind of thing in games, which I think is people that end up playing games for a long time, Mm -hmm. don't care like the joy is not from doing things in the most realistic way possible. Right. Right. That's not necessarily, it's about, that does not equal fun necessarily. Yeah. The game uses realism as a representation for, you know, uh, you know, you can think of it like a chessboard almost, right? Like there are some rules about this game. There's pieces mm-hmm. that move around and the, obviously it's much bigger and more complex, but it's more about the joy often comes more from doing things like moving the pieces in a certain way that like you know activates your neurons yeah and and less about how well those pieces reflect real life right i mean it's almost the opposite of what gamers are looking for yeah you know exactly that's real life sucks like we're we're specifically trying to make it better uh, in a fantasy world and you know grand theft auto is like uh it it markets itself as a very like realistic map right? Like the map Mm -hmm. is based on real places uh, that you live in. And, uh, but the way the game is played, the reality of the gameplay is completely bonkers, right? Like you can run people over and shoot them and take 10 shots to the head and be okay. And, you know, (laughs) drive against traffic and all this stuff and not get immediately arrested. And that's right. that's where the I mean that's where the fun is, right? Like, exactly. It's yeah. cool that it looks like L.A., but it, that alone wouldn't be the fun, right? It's it is a it is uh 
it is a key idea of games, right? This idea that like the fun is not it is to do, like you said, the opposite of what you would do in real life often. Yeah, and this leads to um, a so lot of misunderstanding happens. or um, fear mongering about games, right? Because so many yes. games are about you know Violence. killing people like shooting people in yep. the head it's a power fantasy right like it feels fun because you know it, it's yeah. not real you know they're just fake people and they're often like exploding in fun gory horror movie blood or you know having points pop up like it's all kind of silly yep. in a way that is you know serves the fun but when you tell someone mm-hmm. about it who never plays games they're like you sound like a, <laughs> a complete psycho yeah uh there's a couple of things, interesting things here, I guess, actually. So one is, um, uh, it is, so one is like entertainment has historically always been violent, right? Like if you look at novels, they're often very violent and they depict, viol- you know, the key points of violent events. Like the the Odyssey is about a war. The Iliad is also about a war. Mm-hmm. There's not nothing prevented them from, and they wrote, you know, uh, tragedies usually involving people die. I mean, nothing prevents them from writing a nice uh, drama where there's some drama, but everyone lives happily ever after. I mean, those exist, but um, historically, people, for whatever reason, and we don't necessarily need to understand why, uh, but empirically speaking, people, entertainment has always been about like fighting, war, violence. Yeah, like that, a conflict right? is interesting and one of our, yeah, one of the most visceral. Uh, Examples of combat is violence, you know? Uh, right, right. Um, and, so it's not... Go ahead. So games as a form of entertainment are not any different uh, than books or plays or movies as a form of entertainment in that they're often about violence because that's that historically has been what has done well as entertainment. And we're, uh, and the uh, second we're historically thing is, violent people. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> where we're currently violent people as well. Mm-hmm. Um I guess not you and me because they're betas, but you know the alpha. Yeah, we're open world. betas available wherever you get yeah. your podcasts. <laughs> nice segue. Thanks. Um, and, and the other thing is, like, people often make this joke, and I, I know they don't mean it seriously, but like, oh, you know, the best StarCraft player in the world could uh, would be the best general in the world, or the best chess player <laughs> in the world would be the best. It's just like the point of the game is that they they do not have a connection to reality. Yeah, like, they use reality as a sort of uh, mot. Uh, motif's not the right word, but um, they use reality in a way to like help you understand what's going on and help you like tap yeah, into to have your touchstones to your life. Yeah, exactly. But they in no way represent what real war is supposed to look like. No, right? and if if they, anything, they do not translate. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, th- uh, I was most it, they they absolutely do not translate to what it would take to actually do the event. Like if you're actually a general commanding a army of space marines your experience playing the game is not going to help you at all right uh ender's game is a if you're familiar with that is a uh funny uh example of this Uh, and the last thing is funny uh, genocide in there yeah if you yeah well they they did try to fix that but orson scott card is uh very different than the author of the games i guess in real life Um, yeah anyway uh the last thing is if you understand both those two points i think you should it should be pretty obvious that there's there's no connection between playing games, violence in games, and violence in real life because they're not realistic. Yeah, not yeah, realistic exactly. And they don't help you and, um, do realistic things. You know, a lot of the fear mongering is around like, oh, this is raising people to be, uh, you know, murderers, psycho killers, uh, and. There, there may be some truth to that with certain people who are imbalanced and don't have the support they need. But uh, the uh, the other the other side of that is, and perhaps the more pressing concern I think is that uh, violent games where you are playing a power fantasy, along with movies that are similar, you know, action mm-hmm. movies that are yep. fun, uh, give have given the general population a the impression that they are capable of violence more than they are, or that they would handle mm. themselves in a violent situation well, or they know what to expect. And there's all kinds of right. uh, gaps between reality and the game or the movie, you know, like mm-hmm. there is no way to choke someone to knock them out for an hour and then they'll be fine. <laughs> you, know, right. you don't get hit in the head with a, uh, a beer stein and, 
just fall over for a while. Like you, that's a serious if problem. If you duck, <laughs> if you hide behind the cabinet while there are trained guards protecting a house, and they walk past you, they usually will see you. Yep. They, yep. <laughs> they have more. They don't just keep vision. walking in a straight line. Yeah. Yeah. If and, you think about and being peripheral under, vision in stealth games, and it's... and and like encountering gunfire, you have no idea how yeah. scared your body would be when that happens. Right. You know, you're ready to piss right. yourself, so. You just don't oh, you also, feel that in a game. <laughs> you also can't just run in a straight line for, you know, 30 minutes at a time. Yeah, it's without... sprint. Just hold sprint. Yeah, I can do that for yeah. about a block. Uh, <laughs> and, of course, the obvious one of lives. Like, you're used to mm-hmm. playing Call of Duty, so you think you may be okay at in a violent situation, I guess. But how many fucking times have you died? You've died thousands yeah. of times. You only get one of those, baby. Anyway... <laughs> Well, <laughs> for some of us, only get one. Not if you're a cat. Yeah, you get nine um, at least, including the ones you steal. All right, let's um let's continue moving forward. I wanted to ask you about the. We talked a little about playing being a new player as a kid versus an adult. Uh, mm. You wrote prison mentality here, and I want to understand yeah. what that means. This is this is just something I've been thinking about for a while. Um, you know, there's this. So as a kid, I'll, I'll give the example first. Um, as a kid, I played a lot of bad games for a long time. Sure. Yeah. Uh, because that's all I had access to. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I was, I didn't feel any type of way. I thought the games were fun, and I would play. I just kept playing them again because that's what I had. And then when I had something better, I would do, I would do something better. But I wouldn't necessarily go back to the bad games. Right. 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 Um, what this kind of taps into, you know, a lot of people. Uh, a lot of like stable people that go to prison um, use that time to work out a lot or journal or read. Yeah. So right? self-improvement. Uh, stuff. Productively, right. Productively. Um, uh, because you're, you know, in prison, you don't have anything else to do. Right. So you, and if you want to stay productive, which a lot of people do, um, they, they can use it productively. So I, uh, I always wonder. And, and so in the context of this discussion, it's more like, okay, well, when you have this mentality, when you run into something that's very frustrating, you can keep going, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Because, and I don't know what the because is. I don't know what the reason is. Oh, so Maybe that, it's because, yeah. right? Maybe it's because you're a kid and you just don't have anything else to do like me or your entertainment threshold is much lower or, There's... Uh, well, in prison, obviously it's like you can't do anything else. So if you want to be part of the well do this thing. This right? was, yeah, video games were for me like, they were so interesting and they were like the, the thing I could focus on best. <laughs> so that right. drove yeah. me, that exactly. alone drove me to discontinue. But see, the thing is um, now as an adult with steam and a credit card, mm-hmm. if a game, if you have a bad game, you don't feel compelled to get through the frustration and see it to the end. No, right? Especially if it's not something it. that, yeah, you just say exactly. Uh, but as a kid, somehow I feel like that's different. And that's kind of what I wanted to bring up. And I don't, I don't have an answer or really a thought about it. But um, there is something, there's something maybe to tap into here as a developer where, uh, no, don't don't put people in prison and force them to play your game. But, oh. um, there, <laughs> there might be something to think about uh, with how this works. I would, I wonder if there's been like psycho- psychological studies about how this works exactly. I mean, this I idea have that, some, I've seen some research about like. Uh, new new players that are you know starting games as an adult and how to how to reach them you know oh i'd be super interested in yeah we, we were still things. owed a market research episode so we yeah. can maybe cover it there but uh yeah that would be yeah call of duty was one of you know i talked about nintendo growing the market but call of duty had mm-hmm. designs on growing the market as well like they were like this game should be so ma- we we have to present it as so mainstream that you get like sports gamers to try it. You know that that's like mm-hmm. uh, notoriously they sports they gamers are the most right? the biggest crossover with just like non right people people who don't play games can love a sports game right because you know they love sports mm-hmm. yeah yep yep uh, and by the way sports games are so boring as a gamer like or sorry I, I banned that word as a as someone who plays games, mm-hmm. like I played a baseball game recently because I got like interested in baseball. And I was like, "Oh my god, this is so boring!" But uh, like, you're just even if you're interested in the game, though. Well, you're the, not interested the, in the, the game, the, right? the physical game. This, uh, yeah, even if you're interested in the physical game, because it does, I, in my opinion, it just does a bad job of replicating the physical game. Interesting. And maybe it's a baseball specific thing because I know a lot of gamers that play FIFA. Mm-hmm. Like I think FIFA apparently is really good, but 
um, it's just so boring because it's just like, okay, well, you're just making the same decision. Like, you know the strategy of the real game and the game tries to mimic that and you replicate this and you can't, like, I feel like for me as someone who's played a lot of games, especially a lot of simulation games, the the uh, domain that of choices that you can make is so limited. Right, and uh, that's the, it tries to be, the gamer curse of death. Yeah. Right, limited, right. limited up, limited choices, meaningful choices, limited choices. Yeah, I, um, I've played a lot of sport. Well, not a lot. I played some sports games just because I had friends in college that played them. So you know, I learned mm -hmm. FIFA and some basketball game. <laughs> I don't know, and I liked the more arcadey ones like uh, yeah. NBA Jam and NFL Blitz. Do you know those? Yep. Uh, I think it's N NBA Street, right? Uh, you were thinking of a different one. Jam? NBA Jam was the oh, okay. first like super arcadey. Uh, I see baseball, yes. a basketball yes. game where you had they had like giant heads that were pictures of real oh, okay. players. Interesting. Or you could get there was a giant head mode, and maybe I'm forgetting. It. Anyway, uh, it had stuff like if you got three baskets in a row, you get you're on fire and you get like a turbo meter and all this stuff. Like, oh, okay. So it's, that is what I'm thinking of, but maybe I just got the name. Wrong. Street might've been another an updated version of it. And NFL I Blitz see. was uh, that way too. And it had the fun yep. extra bit of uh, after you've tackled somebody and the whistle's been blown and the play's over, you can continue like jumping on them and smashing them, which is mm. of course a lot of fun. All right. I think... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, actually, no. no. It's nothing important. Let's just move on. Okay. Uh, we've talked a little about non-gamer as a spectrum. I kind of want to move to... Uh, yeah, I mean, you have notes here about making... How to get your... How to get a new person into mm -hmm. games and, yep. you know, needing sort of another person, whether that be a friend or someone playing you're playing online or streaming or mm -hmm. YouTube videos. Yep. Uh, that stuff is going to be, I mean, kind of like any other thing you're going to learn. It's like anything else, yeah. right? It really is just like anything else, except for like the only exceptions to this are really like one things you're forced to do as an adult. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes you just have to, as an adult, you just have to learn how to do your taxes. Yep. Well, right? Speaking of which. And uh, you, the, yeah, the, the, the police, uh, I guess the IRS in this case mm -hmm. explains to you that you have to do this. Uh, same with finances, and you don't you don't need a friend to come guide you through the process. Like sometimes in the adult, you just have to suck it up. Yeah. But um, for almost anything else in life, if it's not uh, if it's not your parents or the the police or whatever coming to tell you to do it, then to get into almost anything, you just need a friend. Yep. Right. Yep. Like exactly. Uh, um, yeah, or taxes. you know they make that difficult on purpose. Uh, like, do it could be, be much It could be but... much simpler. Much simpler. They just they want to. I mean, they want to have you to make mistakes. <laughs> oh, is that why? I see. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I do know that the. I'm not surprised, given how I feel about the U.S. immigration uh, service. So. Oh yeah, I mean they don't want you to yeah. succeed there. Yeah, they they certainly don't, nope. and I I think I it took me a long time to realize that, but uh, now I realize. Yeah, everything it. is designed make to sense. make you give up. <laughs> so. Yep, uh, which they have succeeded in. Yeah, um, I mean that's yeah. Uh, uh, we're talking. Oh, so so the other so there is there is one other thing though, and this is where uh, I have this I have this uh, uh, note here about the value of a parasocial relationship. So instead of a friend, sometimes you can't get in through just a friend because. Well, especially in the age of the internet, like friend means can mean something different, right? Mm -hmm. uh, friend can mean just someone you just randomly met online, like yeah. uh, you and me. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, a lot of times, uh, you can now start learning. You can now start learning to do stuff through uh, content, YouTube and Twitch, yeah, right, and things of that nature. Um, and a lot of people, like when I was in college, this happened a lot. Uh, I remember distinctly one person complaining about how they always picked up hobbies, in this case, bonsai trees, during finals week when they're procrastinating, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they obviously picked that up from, from content. So I think one of the great values of this kind of thing is that uh, watching someone do something is almost, often almost as good as having someone tell you how to do it. Okay. Right. Um, and that can be an important way, um, to get interested in trying something and also in sort of not having to figure out everything by yourself. 
because when you see someone do something, yes. you kind of understand, right? Just by watching, you don't have to think, you don't have to go through the process of like、uh, figuring out the controls,、um, but you can sort of build up that intuition about what to do, and then you know it's basically just bridges the gap between、mm-hmm. not knowing and, how to do and anything. Nowadays, and nowadays, we of course、step. have this system to deliver you those people. Or whatever interest、yeah. you may have, so right,、uh, we got two of them. Well, we got a lot of them, I guess. But yeah, I, I wonder. I assume, I, you know, I wonder how much of this stuff is learned through watching、uh, streamers for kids these days versus playing. Like, what percentage of it is、yeah. just picking it up from watching stuff?、Uh, Probably a lot. I mean, for I know for me, it's a lot, right?、Um, did you ever? It's did you ever watch your friends play games and vice versa? Yes, I did、uh, as a kid quite a lot. I mean, we would.、Uh, well, I I try to spend as little ho- little time at home as possible. So、mm-hmm. I would frequently just like go hang out at my friend's house and like we we usually don't have one console or whatever, right? So we just like take turns playing games or watch each other play games. Yeah, yeah. We did a lot. Of I used、too. to um. I used to like back in the day. Uh, <laughs> man, we really had nothing to do, huh? We used to um like just call each other on our landlines.、Mm-hmm. Um. Like friends that play games, just like call each other on landlines, and then just like listen to the other person narrate、uh, what they're doing and like chat while they were playing games. You can、oh, even see them. Oh wow! I have never done that.、Yeah. That's amazing, though. I like it. I, I want to play the game so much I can listen to somebody play it.、Uh, yeah. Well, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's not an option. Yep. Yep.、Um, yep. I, I, but、awesome. I, I think one thing to bring up with this idea of like learning through other people is like there is a big difference between what Between friends and community, right?、Mm-hmm. Um, and by community, I usually mean like a Reddit community or like a Discord community, where you're mostly strangers and you never, you rarely or never build up a actual friend style relationship with another person,、mm-hmm. because you never get to know any, you don't ever get to know any individual that well. And this can also apply to in-game too. Like there's the League of Legends ranked players community, right? You play, you interact with these people a lot, but you never build up. Yeah, friendship right. usually. Right, right,、um, and you may learn things from people, or at least see them do things that、right. teach you.、Huh. Um, uh, and those things are very different. And、uh, I, one more thing,、uh-huh. and the reason I bring that up is because I think parasocial relationships, weirdly enough, I think kind of bridge that gap. They allow one content creator、uh, to be a fill-in for a friend. That would normally be someone that gets a person into the game. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So if,、uh, so for example, like、uh, a person who is interested and in kind of spread, who is like passionate about a small game, who makes good content and gets popular, now becomes the friend、mm-hmm. for many of the viewers who are trying the game for the first time. Yeah, and、uh, it just makes it so. All those kids out there who don't have people. Shout out to all the kids out there. Shout out to all the kids out there in Iowa who don't have friends to play games with. <laughs> like now you have something that makes you feel part of something, even though it's just you know you、yeah. on the computer. Exactly.、Uh, so we've gone about influencers. Influencers.、Ugh. So、uh, we've gone about two hours, but I want to spend maybe the last half hour、uh, diving into the tutorial, the the whole、yeah. idea of tutorial and and the overall new player experience and how can how can we improve it here at Open Betas, available wherever you get your podcasts.、Uh, we are、uh, open for consultation.、Uh, if you want to hire us as consultants, yeah, our rates rates、um, are reasonable. Can,、uh, well. I mean, that's just the thing I say. They're not reasonable. <laughs> uh, uh, Three thousand dollars an hour.、Uh, uh, we could do more than that once this thing takes off. So、uh, of let's talk a little about tutorials. Do you first of all? Do you play tutorials? Do you skip them? Yes, I play them until I get bored, which is <laughs> which is not which is not that deep into them. Which is yeah, tends、um, to be fast. There, okay. Yeah, there's there's good and bad. Well. I, I hate those terms.、Um, you know,、uh, for a while I had this idea that、um, I I should just cut the words "good" and "bad" out of my vocabulary entirely and never say them again because they were too、um, simplistic. Or there's, yeah, too simplistic too, generally. I I think they they're often meaningless, right? And they often, 
yeah, judgmental, meaningless, and often they turn off listeners, mm. right? Or like whoever you're, like if if you just say good or bad, um, people who feel strongly a certain way just stop listening to everything you're saying if they don't agree with you. Hmm. Okay. Total aside, I, I decided not to do that because that's way too hard. I need to <laughs> speak English. At some point. I mean, you could do it. Um, uh, I've removed. There's I've levels removed of words from my vocabulary over time. Well, yeah, I have. I re- uh, usually that requires. Uh, usually that's because they're um, uh, sort of offensive. But yeah, I mean, you said that. I didn't say that. Uh, so, uh, uh, so you, you don't play the, So sometimes you will, you will skip these things. I, on the other hand, yeah, I am the, the person who plays every tutorial all the way through. Even if it's like a 30 minute tutorial yes. and it's all text. Wow. Well, you if it's are... all text, maybe not. Yeah. Like if it truly, truly is, I'm reading it or doing okay. it and I'm not learning. Like, I'm like, I don't even get what yeah. I'm seeing. Then I might skip it. But otherwise okay. I'll, I'll play your you know, our three hour tutorial in Final Fantasy Very or whatever. Interesting. Okay. I guess sometimes you have to though. Final Fantasy is um I mean like uh so what I'm usually thinking of is like a management game, like City Skylines. Okay. City Skylines actually has a pretty good tutorial, but that's the kind of game where the tutorials really melt your brain. So like if uh, it's not done well. Would civilization fall into that or Yeah, uh yeah, yeah, civilization, yes. Since so imagine if in civilization they they just front loaded the entire tutorial. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, you have a city. Oh, here's how in your city you build uh, units. And then here's how your city expands. And then click next. Here's how uh, you can create a new city with settlers. And settlers create happiness. And here's how happiness works. You have two cities. And then here's how luxury goods work. And here's how you capture luxury goods. And then here's how uh, you can upgrade your city. And here's how your city grows. And here's yeah. how the max size of Okay, right, you get the points yes, yes. that uh, make it. Right, um, that's the kind of game where the tutorial can really, if it's if it's front loaded, I feel like it just melts your brain and you 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 totally yeah you can't you can't exactly you might just bounce totally off the game or you just might yeah. go I didn't learn anything I'm just gonna play and see what happens, right? Which at the end of the day you probably want in your game anyway. Like the, if I mean you feel free to disagree, but uh, if your tutorial is useful it is giving you a small slice of the gameplay. So hopefully right. you, you are using it in context of a fun situation rather than mm-hmm. uh, a lot of earlier games, especially used to have a totally different tutorial level and space. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you know, the, the very popular one with shooters was like military training. Like you'd go and, yeah. and practice yeah. shooting the, the targets or whatever and run through the, the minefield or whatever. Uh, and oh, then you go to the, the game Skyrim? and you're in a totally different place. And yeah. In the Skyrim, is it the Skyrim tutorial? I, I just remember there's one tutorial that's like uh, well known. And by well known, I mean frequently mocked where like you have to point your camera at something mm. to pass the a stage in the tutorial. Maybe that's just a common motif. but that, you know. that sounds familiar. I don't remember. I mean, Skyrim is um, another example of like... Yeah. Uh, you know, skippable cutscenes or skippable intros needing to be in every game nowadays. Yes. Like you have to. Yes. Like what are you doing if you're not? Yeah. Uh, and um especially with non like single player narrative games, like you may not be able to do this in The Last of Us, uh uh now available on HBO Max, but uh you in a game that doesn't have like a, a cinematic story the tutorial may just be like encouraging people to play a first round or a first game, play the whole game at one time and we'll kind of show you stuff along the way, but you'll learn it by doing. Uh, And then the assumption is after one, two, three games or whatever, you're actually playing the game now and they, it opens up a little Mm -hmm. more. That's the, that's usually the hope, right? Um, And, and some uh, narrative games have some advantages but also some disadvantage doing this. So like for me, Persona 4, mm-hmm. um, sort of there's no quote unquote tutorial that ends like the whole first like two dungeons or three dungeons are just an extended tutorial. And yeah. And that, the whole time we don't get freedom. Have you played Persona 5? It's even worse than that. Oh, no, I haven't. I bounced off Persona after trying to play Persona 4. I, I'm just like, I, I really I liked done. those two games, you know, because I, 
I played mm-hmm. them at a time where having anime friends would be nice. So it'll be <laughs> now you have all the anime friends you could want. Yeah, you already There's do. Dozens of us. That's true. Huh? Uh, I <laughs> meant uh, actual uh, friends that are made of anime. Uh, oh, I see. Okay, like the characters ah. in the game. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, yeah, but uh, they have a, like you said, they have a hugely long uh, new player roll uh, roundup or whatever experience yeah. that it doesn't feel it, it gets annoying like it's it's notoriously long mm-hmm. it feels like yes god i just wish i could press start and skip to when the game starts because i'm yes. tired of this and that that's a, probably a pretty bad sign i'd say that's a yeah you know that's that's something obviously that's like context specific but that's something i don't think we have time for but i I do at some point maybe we should do a deep dive into exactly why it feels that way um when we talk about when we talk about how to improve a tutorial um you know whenever whenever i think about how to improve anything i just want to start with trying to boil it down to the core of what it's trying to do so what happens if we just delete every tutorial let's take a couple of examples of games Mm -hmm. like what do we lose if we just completely remove the tutorial and just drop you in um let's take a very simple so, for example, Mario doesn't have a tutorial, right? At least the old ones, like Mario. Yeah, you know, generally Mario three. games are the, the almost like the gold standard of this, of right. teaching you by doing, teaching you by the obstacles in your path and doing and, it in a fun uh, way. Right. And they can do that because they're relatively simple, right? They're actually extremely simple if you think about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, platformers have, a, have that benefit. Yeah, you have a limited amount but, of things you can do. But what did you lose? Uh, and, and new games have such tutorials, right? Like even Super Mario World 2 or whatever, like had the Yoshi, had the little boxes that you hit and they would like tell you things, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, So that's what right. do you lose if you completely... All those optional boxes you, to read. Yeah, yeah. What do you lose if you completely drop everything? Well, I think one of the things we already talked about is uh, you could never learn, like there's, you know, uh, most people are not going to experiment pressing every button, right? Certainly... Right. I would not do that. Um, there's lots of things you that. could never learn um, by by trying things without someone telling you. Mm-hmm, right? mm-hmm. You may never learn uh, to jump. Well, I guess you you have to learn to jump, but you may never learn like running, like in Dark Souls, for example. Exactly. Yeah, or uh, what comes to mind? I remember learning doing the Gears of War tutorial and learning how to do the quick reload or action reload or whatever they call it would not be obvious unless you had seen mm-hmm. tutorial of it. And actually, this just reminds me of so a second... you may never use it the whole game. Oh, sorry. Yeah, exactly. Um, this reminds me of a second idea, which is like sometimes when you're trying to figure things out by doing... Mm-hmm you feel like, okay, can you just tell me how this works? Like, I don't want to experiment anymore and figure out how this works. This usually comes up when you're trying to like, quote unquote, min-max or like figure out systems. But, um, Do you, you know, can you sometimes think of an you're trying to figure out. Yeah, like happiness in in Civ. Uh-huh. Right? Have you played Civ? Civiliz- so uh, uh, I was big on Civilization 2 and I played a little of 4. Okay. I wonder if it's probably like very similar, but there's this idea of like, oh, well, here's happiness, yeah. right? Like the happiness is a number that is important. Mm-hmm. And if it's bad, here's what happens to you. And if it's good, here's what happens to you. Yeah, there's like uprisings uh, and stuff. Yeah, and you're just like, okay, but how do I improve my happiness? And it tells you a couple of ways, mm-hmm. right? But there's a lot of systems under the hood that you can't, like I feel like, in my opinion, you can't figure out just by doing it, right? Yeah, uh, okay. Because... And the reason is off is because happiness has many inputs. It's a single output number, right? But it has many inputs. And it's not clear when you make a change um, whether that change correlates with the change in happiness. Right, and right? there's probably a delay between you doing yeah, it exactly. and something happening. Yeah. So when you lack that kind of feedback, you, as a player, even as a player that's dedicated to figuring out how it works, and obviously speedrunners do this, right? Like one of the pillars of speedrunning is like really figuring out how these precise mechanics work like speedrunners uh speedrunners do this a lot where they kind of like bang their head against and around uh a literal or proverbial wall and figure out exactly how it works and or mm-hmm. how to clip out of the bounds of that wall right yes um 
But that's not something that's something that takes like a community and a lot of time. And that's, yeah, that's really like, not something you can you're expect. getting into the literally try everything area. Right. And that's not something where you can reasonably expect a, a average uh, or a random player to that wants to enjoy your game to to do that. Right. But yeah, the game rewards you for making decisions that imc- like you, you. The point is it's a strategy game. Right. And your point is you're trying to make decisions that increase your numbers. And one of the numbers is happiness. So. As a player, it's very frustrating when you get caught in this in-between where it's like, well, I don't really know how this works, but I have to increase it in some way. So so, uh, so in that in that uh, example, do the you said they do have some tutorials up front, but a lot of it they just totally leave to the manual? Or how, how does it work? Oh, yeah. So um, I think it does a pretty good job, Civ. I mean, Civ, as far as strategy goes, is like fairly simple, right? Um, Mm-hmm. So it does it does basically teach you all the important inputs. Um, but I think that's a good example of how you can't, there's a lot of things you can't learn through trial and error, basically. Right? Yeah. And that becomes very true when the systems get more complex. Like Mario has an extremely simple system, right? All the enemies have one HP. You can damage them in this way. And you also have one HP. There's like very and- few... And Mario also, uh, they will mix in unique control schemes for one level and then Mm -hmm. not go back to it until maybe later in the game for another level. And when they do, they'll do have a little recap box pop up to tell you how to do it, which reminds me of, um, do any games do like an adaptive tutorial kind of thing where if you do miss something because you're just not, you never learned it or you're just not using it. Does it say like, hey, no, hey, dude, I noticed you're not using your your alt. Like, uh, it does this, and why don't you try it right now? And we just gave you your mana back or whatever. Aha! Uh-huh. So, this is a uh, what a great segue. You read my mind. Okay. Uh, you actually read my mind this time. It's not even in the notes. Um. Uh. So, <laughs> so games do do this, right? Uh, I think a lot of more modern games are more and more trying to do this. Um. Okay. And I think the reason, so why is this, why intuitively is this good? Like, why does it feel good? I think it really boils down to that's the experience you get when you play with your friend. Or in other words, when your friend is teaching you how to play. Yeah, they'll right? remind you in those moments, right? Yes. Like they know uh, the thing that, you know, they, they have some kind of relationship with you. They understand generally how you think. They understand mm-hmm. the game. They understand what you might want to do in this situation. And they will... Uh, pick a contextual moment to teach you things rather than uh, the approach of teaching you everything or teaching you nothing. Um, they pick what they deem to be a nice contextual uh, relevant moment to teach you something. And mm-hmm. then they pop in and then they let you, hopefully, I mean, obviously every relationship is different, but hopefully they let you just continue on your way once you figure that out or whatever. Right? Yeah, and ideally that's a that's a really good way to like we've talked about it's a really good way to learn uh right having that contextual adaptive feedback (laughs) yes um and there's more ways than one to get this so one thing one good way in my opinion to get this that happens a lot now that we have the internet is having resources to look up right yes so now instead of having to try everything right having to try everything to figure out how happiness works i'm like oh my happiness is low that's kind of weird I thought I did everything right. Let me go to the Civ wiki and Mm -hmm. figure out if I'm missing some stuff, right? Yeah. And Um, a bad thing that can happen in that process is you reading too much. Well, I call it bad. uh, mm -hmm. Reading too much into existing the existing meta and not really having a chance to play that part of it yourself. You know what I mean? I think... Yep, for sure. I think a lot of times that could be self-destructive, right? Yeah. Especially if you have a certain, uh, we know a couple of people like this, right? If you have a certain attitude, if you have certain um, maybe predisposition to always feel the need to optimize as early as possible. And, and I have this too, to a mm-hmm. certain extent, to be honest. Um, I worked with a like lot of min-maxers at Riot. Yeah, that's, that sure is me. Um, so for example, one of my favorite games, uh, one of the games on my list of top I forget how big my list was, 25 maybe, is Fire Emblem Fates. or Fire Emblem your list, if, by the way. In Japan. 
Uh, I think I have at some point. I'll, I'll send it again. We yeah. can maybe do a show on our Did list. I give you mine? Um, I don't remember. Okay. Well, maybe. Um, anyway, one of my favorite games on our list is Fire Emblem Fates slash Fire Emblem If. I never finished that game because mm-hmm. I would frequently... Re- I I uh, liked a lot of things about that game. One of the things was the way to like build, grind and build out your characters. And I planned out all my characters. And then mm-hmm. when I messed up or like if I found a new idea, I just restarted. Cause, okay, um, this is like those Pokemon people with the yes. The secret I, I'm stats. also a Pokemon. I'm also a Pokemon people. Yes, that's me. Um, what are those secrets? There's like secret stats that. So, oh you, man, I want to do an episode on this too. Well, I have a lot of let's thoughts let's on IVs. let's put that aside because yeah, that is <laughs> they're that is they're the IVs. Thing. They're individual values. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yes, I um, remember seeing that for the first time on the internet and being le- and like yeah. reading it and being like, what this this isn't in the game like what is this hey here's that's a great example though of something that you would never figure out by playing. never never i like, know none of my I'll, friends knew like yeah it probably would, only happened when people went to tournaments or yeah once online only only once you start doing this thing where you look at your two pokemon that are the same level and you're like huh that's weird they have different stats but that's so few people and even of the small amount of people that are that may have done that, so few of them would put in the effort to try to figure out how it worked. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I mentioned to my wife when playing Pokemon Go that that system is is there. There is some. It's not the same as in the core games, but there is a there are hidden elements. And right. she's like, I, I, I don't don't tell me. I don't care. <laughs> like, this don't care. That's one of the things. Sometimes you just yeah. have to not tell people because you don't want them to think about it, right? Yeah. Like people, yeah. if you, you know, knowledge, uh, w- w- ignorance is bliss in a lot of mm-hmm. times, mm-hmm. right? Like if you tell, it, like me, I, I found this category. If you tell me something like this in a game that, uh, although like I have pretty good control over myself now these days that I can just be like, yeah, I don't care. I'm just going to not optimize this. But for a lot of people, uh, if you tell them something like this, they will kind of freak out and get paralysis, right? Or right. try they to need, optimize for their brain. They need way to before optimize yeah. all that shit, and every every little detail counts. Yep. Yeah, um, I mean that's a that's a. Uh, I think of that as like almost a, another category, another way of playing games, like like speed right. running. Uh, speed is running is like that. Yep. Because yep. you're you're adding new goals that don't necessarily exist in the game. Yep. Exactly. Um, but back to your idea about the adaptive tutorial, I think that's it's great because it the idea is that it replicates a friend, and this is another part of the parasocial relationships thing, right? Like mm-hmm. you can have a very similar thing where it's like if you're just having fun watching someone play this game that you also play, you glean a lot of stuff over time that you don't even realize, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you just get a ton of information that is relevant and helpful, hopefully, um, because they're relevant and helpful to this other person's playthrough. Um, and you, uh, or you just see it. Like they may not even, they may not even say it, but, uh, and I think you mentioned this in speed running too. You just see someone do something and you're like, oh, that's, I can also use that because I have, you know, as a player, I now have enough contextual understanding to understand what's going on. Right. And I can see how that's different. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Influencers, influencers are, are the new way. No, but, uh, so I have an idea for, for improving contextual tutorials. So one, one thing is, um, uh, they, these already exist, but they're often hard-coded, right? Like mm-hmm. a developer, and I think what usually happens is a developer uh, notices in testing or whatever that, uh, oh, people at this point often don't realize this. And then they yeah, make Yeah, they forget that step. they can do this thing. Yep. And they're like, oh, well, this is common. Uh, you know, we have data through testing, and then I'll just hard-code something here to remind you if uh, you don't do this, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, in Magic, I think uh, Mauro, Mark Rosewater gives a lot of examples of times in testing where like people don't understand how a mechanic worked. Mm-hmm. And uh, sometimes they like the way it's worded, right? Because Magic is like a reading comprehension yep. game. <laughs> yep. The world's the first, first reading comprehension type game. Um, yeah, you have to know what they mean by yeah. certain words. And so sometimes people just misunderstand what the words mean. And sometimes they're just like, you know what? Let's not fight these people. Let's just change the rules to make it do what they think it does. <laughs> That's funny. Um, you may place two tokens here. May yeah, not. Exactly. Um, so uh, I think one of the things, this can be a teaser for a later episode, one of the ways this can be done uh, in a scalable 
and more robust way is through AI. Mm, okay. Okay. So, is it a, uh, uh, actually, no, no, go on, go on. <laughs> no, go ahead. Oh, I was, uh, okay. Um, I think AI, this is a pretty good application of where AI technology is at. Mm-hmm. Um, if you so you can you can map uh uh well i guess I, I won't go into the details of how i understand ai to work although i will say that chat gpt is way beyond where i thought ai technology was at and really? is frankly somewhat frightening yes uh huh. to I'm someone who doesn't any of that shit is uh, as I'm I'm not convinced any of that shit is what we should be worrying about. There's much more pressing. Oh things. no no I'm not I'm not like worried worried about it. But I'm I'm just saying it is like, a disturbing. Uh, yeah, before yeah before I knew about ChatGPT, I was like, Psh, you idiots don't AI is so uh, dumb and straightforward. Right? What is it about it's this? Like, uh, ChatGPT does things that I like. ChatGPT can do things that I. As far as I know, it shouldn't have enough data to do. So AI hmm. is trained on data, right? Um, and it, uh, at least in my prior understanding, it made a pretty linear mapping of decisions to data. So like if you feed it enough data about translation, like if you feed it enough text from English mm-hmm. and then in French, it could do a pretty one-to-one. It, it will like basically give you a translation based on what the te- what the data says, right? ChatGPT mm-hmm. can solve math problems. Right, you can mm-hmm. take your college uh, math problem, and you can feed it to ChatGPT, and it will give you a, um, it will show work and give you a solution. And I am confused at how it can do that correctly, and uh-huh, accurately. Okay. And um, so I'm not, I'm not scared of it. Uh, but I am, like, I no longer think, oh. Psh- AI is so easy. You guys don't know what we're talking about. Now I'm just like, huh? I didn't think it could okay. do that. All right. Um, anyway, um, um, but anyway, I, I think I think a tutorial is a good application of AI in the sense that you have, uh, you can train a model. Um, you can have it output a pretty. You can have it do the Google Home thing, right? Basically, if you just imagine taking Google Home or or Alexa, mm-hmm. right. Uh, sometimes it's like, oh, you're near this place. You can check out these three restaurants that you, um, right? It's that are near you that you might stuff. like, right? Yeah. Because it's around the time when you normally eat lunch. Um, yep. Basically, I think that that's the kind of thing that AI can do pretty well, and I think would be helpful in this kind of case. Okay. There's also while you're uh, as you brought that up, I there's also the idea of balance of uh, when you give these messages, uh, yeah, because it can matter. You know, I'm sure we've mm-hmm. all had the ex- well, <laughs> I hope we've all had the experience where I'm like trying to do a special jump or whatever, and I keep mm. fucking it up and dying. And each time yep. the the game pops up, the you know press circle, 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 the triple jump. And I'm like, yes, uh, yes, I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> or, you know or the uh, or the uh, one other example is I think it was when I was playing Uncharted. This is before I was very good with uh, some of the PlayStation analog stuff. Mm-hmm. When I was playing, when I died repeatedly, it was like, it looks like you're having a little trouble. You sure you don't want to bump the difficulty down to easy? <laughs> oh, buddy? yeah. And I'm like, no, no, I don't. <laughs> rude. Games are very rude these days. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I get that. Uh, so you know what game I think does this really well and, and also is actually very similar to AI mm-hmm. uh, is Mario Maker. Have you oh, played Mario yes, Maker? Yes, I have. Mm-hmm. And you know what I mean, right? When you die, you see, first of all, you see where everyone else died, which is like kind of funny. But mm-hmm. you also can see, actually, I don't remember this case, but I think generally you can like see lines or like where people went through or like, actually, maybe not. I think you not can a, download ghosts, like you can watch oh, other people. Oh, ghosts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. You can watch other people do it. Um, and try to like keep up in real time with them. Yeah. And I think... I think a lot of uh, I think that kind of thing is more helpful than teaching you and than trying to teach you one specific thing. Like I think you can learn a lot more once you understand generally what's going on. Because mm-hmm. I, I guess I guess that that's a good point. It's it, it split it's split out into like two phases, right? One is like um, one phase is like 
do you understand the basics of how to do all the stuff? And then the next phase is like, um, well, I'm stuck uh, doing this, like something within the system, right? But I need uh -huh. to, I don't know how to solve the problem that the system presents to me rather than, but I know how to do all the actions. I don't know which actions to take. Right. right. And there's certain, there's certain details about those actions that don't get covered in a text explanation like right like right. timing or uh yes uh well timing is the only example i can think of but <laughs> there are for those. for a platformer for sure it's just timing right but if you think about things like um uh if you think about like a jrpg right it's like oh well there's mana actually and there's mana regeneration between uh floors or there's not mana re regeneration between fights mm -hmm. right or there's um there's like cooldowns or whatever um, that all come up right right that's um yeah that's one of the things in general where watching like watching the whole action of something teaches you a lot more than any one individual fact because often there's like way too many individual facts and sometimes they even get boiled down in my opinion too far where it's so what like, do you what do you think of uh ghost type uh, tutorial bits like seeing seeing a ghost of your character or whatever uh do the thing and maybe the maybe the button prompts show up next to them or on screen so you can see the timing as well like, i think that would be great yeah that sounds great it, but uh, that's uh -huh. hard to apply in all games right yeah is it so why for example it, why is that so uh so in a platformer it's very easy to apply right, right and mario okay. kart similarly is very in a first person game for example it gets a little harder because um, you never look at your character from that from the perspective of a ghost. Now, your mm -hmm. the ghost maybe could be through your first person view, um, but that can be a little harder too because you're like, uh, I don't know. I, I, maybe that would work. No, the the problems I initially thought of maybe aren't as big as I thought. So maybe maybe uh, the first person ghost could work. Okay. Uh, for a game like Civ, um, the ghosts. Uh, you get bored. I feel like you would get bored very fast watching the ghost because it will take a long time for anything to happen. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just right. sitting there watching really, a game of Civ. Yeah. Um. So it that can be hard, but I think that's a big. You know, any any situation where you can get a visual holistic view of a tutorial rather than a bunch of individual discrete nuggets. Um, well, and I like that sort of ghost thing too, also because of the. You're you're less likely to have an interruption, uh, mm -hmm. which every every pl players hate when there's like the, the action freezes suddenly yeah. and there's a pop up message. I mean, it's like yeah. being on anywhere on the internet. Uh, it sucks. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it's a pop up. So if you Not can good. avoid that ever happening, that would be nice. Uh, you know, this reminds me of GTA uh, four and five. And I think The Witcher 3 also has this problem. They have tooltips pop up in real time during the action. Mm. Uh, things you have to read, like in GTA specifically, you're driving and shooting. And in the upper right, it it displays, uh, you know, use this stick oh, to look around yeah, or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I see. Or they may teach you things like that, where they the instructions are not even on the center of the screen, but they're like up up in the upper right, and they're timed, and you can't look at them again after they're gone. And it's uh, I, I get what they're trying to do; they're trying to not pause the action at all. Right. But it uh, it makes it so you you're likely to miss a lot of that stuff and just figure it out by doing. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. That seems that seems just bad. It's hard to. Um... It's a, I guess we can break. Uh -huh. hmm? Well, I was just going to mention, um, I wonder, you know, because we've covered a lot about how uh, streamers and such can mm -hmm. be this source of tutorial nowadays, essentially. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Is there value in moving that experience into the, the product itself? Or are developers just better off assuming... Or, or even maybe recommending uh, streamers to watch to learn. You, you know what I mean? Right. Well, I think developers do do that, actually. Uh, the reason I keep saying influencers uh, kind of jokingly is that 
uh, like influencer advertisement is like all the rage now, right? Yes, yes. Um, so I think developers do that. I, I think there's some problems if you rely on that solely. Um, mm -hmm. Because first of all, I think the first problem is that developers, or sorry, is that influencers um, are not, their goal is not to teach, right? Their goal mm -hmm. is to entertain. And so they very understandably often would choose to do something more entertaining rather than something that's better educational content, right? Yes. When they die, they are more likely to say, oh my God, rather than to be like, oh, I see what I did wrong here. See, I should have done X, Y, and Z, and mm -hmm. you should too, right? Um, so I think things like, and there's various problems that are also in that vein, right? Um, the second I think is more, uh, more um, unsolvable, which is that uh, streamers, you can't pay a streamer in every language and on every platform that's available to everyone that wants to play your game, right? It's hard to, yeah. So, yeah, so Twitch, for example, for example, um, like is, well, I guess it's universally available, but like YouTube is not available in some parts of the world, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, et cetera. And so I think you, because of, basically because of that, I think you can't move the whole thing in there. Um, but they actually do do this. So for example, Lost Ark uh, does video tutorials by, that, uh, by partnering with content creators, like their biggest streamers. So, so the they, content creators actually make the videos. Yeah. So so uh, and it'll show up. I watched in, a bunch of these for the raids we did. Uh, yeah. So so there. that's that's independent, but like there's some official ones as well. So mm -hmm. like um, the company will pay uh, a streamer to uh, make a video about the class, a new class that's releasing, right? And they'll mm -hmm. put this video on. Uh, well, first of all, they'll put it on their own channel, right? But they're the company will put it on the, all the official channels, right? Mm -hmm. Like in the advertising for the new class, they will right under it say, and go watch this video by, you know, popular streamer so-and-so to learn the ins and outs of this class, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think they do that, but I, I do think you can't rely on that solely um, because the, and the other thing is a lot of people don't like learning through watching videos. Um, mm. I have this, I have this conversation at work uh, somewhat recently. Someone mentioned that like they really don't like video tutorials because they take so long. Uh, um, I'm I'm kind of the same way. Like I, right. my, if I don't have to watch all of this tutorial video, yes, which is different from how I am with games. But like, I was, mm -hmm. for example, I was trying to fix my dishwasher a couple months ago, <laughs> and I was looking for the answers to a specific question, and on your uh, mind. And what's that? <laughs> Nothing. I, is, that a, a song is, reference. is that a lyric? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, I, I thought I knew it was relatively simple what I needed to do. So when I saw like, oh, this video is 30 minutes, I'm just like, right. I don't even, exactly. I'm going to find one that's five minutes. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And then if I need to, I'll go to the longer ones, but I'm looking for right. that most convenient way, you know? And most of the time, what ends up happening is that you go back to text, right? So... Yeah, um, I, and, I certainly prefer text because you can read exactly what you want. Yes, and I think this goes back to kind of so like one thing is um, video content is much better, in my opinion, for exploration, right? Like mm -hmm. for me personally, I really I just like watching videos on how how to be good at a game or how to cook something or uh, mm -hmm. how to do X and Y because they are more engaging to me than reading a similar article right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but when i need to actually figure out how to do something and especially if i have something specific in mind that i need to do the video is not a good format for that right uh what's an example of specifically you have um, in mind to do well specific well fixing your dishwasher is one thing right oh, okay, or a okay. common example is like a recipe when i if i generally know how the recipe works but i'm like okay i need to know the ratio like for tonight i need to know the ratio of tomatoes to everything else in mm -hmm. uh curry right a, a generic uh, tomato curry base uh, videos are not helpful i would need an actual recipe where i can sort of just see the numbers and answer my specific i see I right have. yeah exactly okay um, and see this is one, one of those times where having a friend next to you solves all your problems like every single one of these problems right because they can adapt to what you need um, and you don't have to pay them probably right mm -hmm. if you are completely new to the game you can be like hey just play Hey, can you just play through the game and let me see how stuff works? 
mm-hmm. and then you see them do something. It's like, oh, that's cool. How'd you do that? Right? You can ask right, a specific right. question. Uh, and then if you once you're ready to go on your own, uh, they can give you sort of the big picture like text rundown. Right? Like, mm-hmm. okay, well, in this game, you are X and Y. Your goal is to go here. You jump by pressing A. You move left and right. Whatever, right? And then when you need a specific contextual clue, they can do that too. They can be like, "Hey, uh, here, you know, here you forgot that you could do whatever, right? Or you can try doing double jump or whatever." Mm-hmm. Um, and if you need like a detailed system rundown, they can do that too. Like, okay, so uh, in order to maximize your mana, you have three different traits, and one of them is intelligence. And if you also can encrypt. Okay, and so on. Okay, right? a lot. Yeah. Um, but they can they can fulfill a human basically can fill all these roles, and these are roles that are needed at different times in the learning process, right? Yeah, and maybe needed forever. Um, I, and, so, oh, go ahead. Oh, and the last thing is, you know, a video, a text tutorial, a wiki type resource, um, a a ghost tutorial. They can all fulfill one of these roles quite well, but they're often wrong. Uh, in the specific <laughs> yeah, context wrong, yeah. about about when uh, well they can be factually wrong but they're also sometimes wrong in when they show up right especially if they're in the game like you mentioned uh, in the game sometimes you don't... for where you are yeah okay yeah 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 like I mean, sometimes uh... in the game it's like hey you want to lower the difficulty and you're like no right if you are a human sitting next to me you would know that the problem isn't that I would need to lower the difficulty right mm-hmm uh, or if it is, you're more likely to listen to your friend. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's also true. And and uh, I think there's an assumption you're not getting you're not going to get the same level of game with easy mode because that's sometimes true. Uh, uh, shoot, what was I going to say there? Uh, it'll come back to me. I don't remember. So, yeah, but uh, in hmm? in oh. terms of uh, so what what does what is going to make a so we've talked about elements of what makes a good tutorial. Uh, do you think, uh, do you think that if it's, do you think it, oh, that's what it was, uh, adding on top of, uh, the complication of having to go to different places to learn mm-hmm. everything, uh, you know, add on top of that, a new, a new gamer, a new player there, there's no way they're going to do right. that. There's, it's just yeah. not going to happen yeah. unless you are sitting there and like hand the phone to them or, or interpret right. the phone for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly, because it's like homework, you know. Yeah, it is. It is exactly like homework, and homework is fun in a very specific case, which is when you're super interested in the topic, right? Yep. yep. And in every other situation, it's it's awful. And it seems, it seems like what we're going towards is there. In in an ideal world, in an ideal learning experience, there is no feeling of being in a tutorial, or there is no. I would tutorial hope so, yeah. step it, it all feels yeah. like part of the game and still manages to balance the feeling of freedom at the same time if you're talking about the persona example uh yeah. where if you feel like you're just you've learned enough to play like let them play a little let them play some right uh, and then yeah contextually being able to adaptively do stuff but i'd I'd love to see. Do you do you have any games that you think do learning well or do the tutorial well? Mm. Um, I think there's like specific uh, repeated uh, things that I like. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's like good ideas. I don't know that I I can think of all the time. I have anything that has like a great implementation. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of gotcha games do this thing where at the beginning of the game you just enter a fight, which is kind of the core gameplay. Yep, and you enter a fight with not your own characters, with a bunch of, you know, super strong characters or story characters or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but what? So I think this is a good idea. I think this drops you uh, into the core mechanic, which I guess is important, right? Like, mm-hmm. you want the story to be short and sweet, and you want it to cover the most important things. And so, if the fight, if the fighting is the core gameplay, then you should do that. Um, and, uh, but I think what I don't like is a lot of games in this part tell you exactly what to do, right? Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. here, you know, use this skill on this enemy and then use this skill on this enemy. And I feel like that- Do a uh, square, square, square triangle on this. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, okay. Exactly. And I think that is where you run into a problem because you're no longer learning anything. You're just pressing the buttons that the game tells you so that you can go away, 
right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I see that. I mean, I'm learning in um, that scenario, but right. yeah, I see for most Actually, people, you know what? I, you're, you're torn away uh, from... What's that? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm just saying, yeah, that... Every time we talk about like a tutorial, I, I imagine my mom or my wife or, or, you know, a friend who's just never played games trying to play it. And right. You have a good point. Like if you're not, if you keep getting stopped and have to be forced mm-hmm. through things that you don't want to do, you're not only are you not necessarily learning, you're, you're having a bad time. Right. Exactly. Um, and you, uh, you have no agency in those situations, right? I think that's kind of the biggest, I, I guess one of the other annoyances is that in this system have no agency, you feel like you're not doing anything meaningful, right? Like, um, so Roller Coaster Tycoon has basically a tutorial level where it's like mm-hmm. a very, very easy level. Actually, I don't remember if this is true, but I think this is true. I think that's anyway, right. a lot of, that sounds a lot right. of ma- yeah, a lot of management games have this where it's like super easy. You can't fail, but it takes so long. I mean, you are playing the game, but you quickly figure out that you can't fail and you're just here to learn stuff which is fine but uh you would rather it be over so you can actually play the real game, right it, it right? F- like to your point it, it feels like you're not playing the game yeah it feels like all right let's get to it rather than oh i'm mm-hmm. having fun with the game and learning <laughs> at the same time right. how to play see that's where the struggle comes in because for an actual new player that might be fun right mm-hmm. they might mm-hmm. enjoy that process maybe uh maybe not um Maybe I mean, that's actually a... I think it's always going to be an advantage to make it feel... I mean, a lot of online games do this shit that, uh, you know, your first 10 matches or whatever are not against real mm-hmm. people or yeah. you're you're unlocking stuff every time and gaining levels after the first match and right. all this stuff that is like, oh, yeah, you're, you're doing great, you're learning and trying to make it seem like... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess... Okay, you know what? Of- this makes me realize something. I, I actually think... I think... Uh, so there's this tutorial treadmill, right? That you kind of just referenced mm-hmm, where it's mm-hmm. like you, it's a long extended process and they're, they're trying to build it up one at a time. But what ends up happening is that um, you're basically being walked through the whole process without really having agency. It's basically like uh, advanced reading tutorial, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Because um, you're like plopped in a specific situation where you can do a specific thing. Yeah, and yeah. And, 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 and they do build it up read. over time, right? But often like, the previous things don't flow into the next thing. It's just mm. like a new thing. Um, yeah. So I think this is the heart is in the right place, but I think I think this is generally just bad. Um, is is my conclusion. Uh, but I will say one one game that I think does a great tutorial. Uh, we mentioned this before is WoW or any MMOs in general, right? Mm-hmm. Why is it a great tutorial? Because it lasts twenty two hours and it's an engaging twenty two hours, right? I seem and to remember re- when I first picked up WoW before I realized I wasn't going to play it, you go to like a yep. little tutorial zone and do a bunch of boring stuff. Yep, they you do. That? Uh, and you um, named like so-and-so, as I recall. Uh, sort of. I mean, the tutorial zone, but the tutorial zone, you still feel, well, first of all, there's two, I think there's two differences. One is um, you're still, you still have full agency. You're still doing the same stuff that you're doing in the rest of the game. Mm-hmm. Um, and, the second thing is you you can't skip it. Everyone has to do it. Uh, but it's okay because you're doing the same thing you're doing the rest of the game. You're still questing. You're still killing enemies. Um, it's just a very, it's like a safe little specific area that you right, start. Right, right. Okay. Right. Um, and and the, rest of the, the rest of the leveling process is a tutorial too. I mean, you're gaining every two levels, which is like 30 minutes to two hours. Uh, you get a new skill, and now you you basically mm-hmm. have a live tutorial of your new skill, right? Um, mm-hmm. You can do, and it feels relevant because you're doing something. Uh, you're doing something that, that almost everyone has to do unless you pay, um, and you have full control over, like you can go to a different zone, right, and explore a different story if you want. Uh, to your, you are to still your, playing the game. To your point about. Uh having freedom right off the bat or having, you know, not mm. feeling that super restricted feeling. Um, there are a number of games. I mean, it, it was a big thing for a while. The uh, starting you with a fully unlocked, like in an action game, starting you with a mm-hmm. fully unlocked character yep. fighting a ton of things that you can just like cut through and yep. hit all the buttons and try all the fancy things. And then 
you get you know you then go back in time or whatever to the real beginning yep. of the game where you don't have all these powers and you unlock them one by one yep what do you think of that <laughs> is that good well actually that was kind of what i was referencing right the thing okay. that uh gotcha games start you off on where you have a max character. yeah you're um, right yeah that is like the gotcha game thing and i think uh I have mixed feelings about it. I think it's good in some, like, I think it's good uh, framework wise. Like, I think it's a good idea. Um, I don't think the implementation is actually good uh, for a couple of reasons. The first issue I see is that um, just because you have all these tools doesn't mean that using them feels meaningful, right? Yeah, in fact, it um, feels pretty meaningless. If it feels it's pointless. The first thing right? you do, yes. like, they all because you're like, well, like the same. Yeah, it's like, well, yeah, every button is, oh, okay, this is cool, this looks cool, but I don't really know what it means, right? Yeah, I didn't learn um, anything from this. I'm just being presented the the sort of the promise right. of the game. Um, and the second problem I see is that, well, you lose it. So if you learn something, then you don't have it anymore, right? So yeah, what, what was well the point of all this? Yeah. Um, that being said, I think this framework is good, right? Because you you do want to drop someone into your core gameplay. And I think you do want to, uh, I think it's a good idea to have them uh, be able to explore the full range of what's possible in in some sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, I just don't, th don't know that it's a good fit for, so for example, in a shooting game, I think it would be a pretty good fit, right? Because, uh, in a shooting game, the only real character development you have is like what gun you pick, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think it's cool to like put, you can just put someone in a range and be like, hey, do these range things, uh, you know, like hit the targets and hit specific targets, but you can pick whatever gun you want, like go over here and try this gun if you Right, if you right, want, they do do right? that, okay. Because um, that would be cool because that gives you a lot of agency, that gives you, that keeps you engaged because you're like, oh, I don't like this gun, oh, I like this gun, right? Yeah. Um, so, for example, um, in an MMO, uh, oh, WoW does this too, actually. When you make a new class, uh, you get like a leveled up version of the class and you can just go fight a boss that won't kill you, but is not a tutorial boss. Like you actually oh. have to do enough damage to them to, to do something. Every, to, like, every so you said this is every time you level up or? No, this is, a, this is when you boost a character. So it's not really a tutorial, but it kind of is. So uh, when you isn't that, isn't skip, that once you've already played the game, you like skip the main part or the first. Uh, part? You can buy. I don't remember exactly how it works and what. It probably doesn't work this way now. But at, at the time I played, um, you can you can buy a boost, or if you got a refer a friend, you could also get a boost mm -hmm. to skip a bunch of levels and go straight to like close to the end game. Right. Right. Okay. Um, and when you do this, they give you a tutorial where yeah, they they put you in a scenario and then you have to fight a boss and. It's a boss that, again, like I said, won't kill you, but you have to like be at least adequately competent. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, to they say and I think this there. goes back to something you said earlier about like it's really more important to function in the system. Like the game wants you want the game to present a system that the player can then solve rather than a bunch of linear things, right? Yeah, rather than it's just sort of button prompts. Right. Exactly. And I think that's, I guess, that's kind of the key. Um, because again, with the, you know, with the shooting range, it's like, well, the game presents you a bunch of questions and you can solve them in a way that you like, and you can explore why you do so. And it's the same with the MMO. Right? Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's wrap this up. I think we got, we got enough. I think so too. We can always revisit. Uh, I had a good conversation. Uh, all right, cool. Well, all thanks right. for listening to open betas with Regal and swim fan, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Swim Fan, and see I you, am Regal. Oh right. Hey, what about me? What am I? <laughs> I I'm over? Swim Fan, and that's it. Okay, <laughs> let's do it. I'll do it the right way. <laughs> no, 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 you, no, no. That's good. I'm that's Swim it. Fan, and I'm Regal, and Maybe. we are. Let's say it at the same time. Oh the no, no, no! Open no, no. beta. <laughs> All right. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> the end. Uh,